Почитуване и посетители на Mactal.mk Денес ка имаме много интересно интервю с Сем Вакнен економски експерт и новинар а, от а, Израел, кој што живее по-долго време и во Македонија, бидејќи неговата сопруга е македонка. Ке имаме много интересно интервју, сакам да поразговараме малку и за а, Палестина, за Израел. Пред неколку дена беше денот на Холокауст, ако не се лажам, господин Вакнен. Па ке поразговараме малку и за односот а, Македонија кон Евреите, особено на проблематичен период во, за време втората Светска војна, кога биле истребени Евреите од Македонија. Ке поразговараме и за филмот Трето полувреме, ако може, за тоа и така да поразговараме. Ке би интересно интервју. Јас ке се обидам на моменти интервјуто да го водам на англиски. Сакавме ова интервју да може да го следат и оние жители на Македонија, кои што не го знаат македонски јазик, па може би сакаве да го слушнат ова интервју. Господин Вахтен разбира македонски, но не може да се уште да зборува македонски, така што јас ке се обидам да го водам на интервјуто на англиски и се извинувам доколку мојот англиски е на моменти ужасен. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say that at all. <laughs> Let's uh, you sir on uh, English so the people who will hear this interview. So today we are, are doing the interview with uh, Sam Vaknin, economic, uh, economic expert and uh, chief editor of uh, politician. Global, dot, uh, dot com and uh, very famous in Macedonia expert uh, very very often you, we can hear your analysis sir your uh, in some time you were also a columnist in Dnevnik so we can hear, uh, read your thinking about Macedonia uh, in those columns now sometimes we can uh, read your columns in uh, makto.mk this type that we're making this interview mm -hmm. thank you very much for your time thank you for having me uh, let's talk about uh, first uh, Let's talk about Palestine and Israel for for uh, for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that uh, that problem uh, it's uh, very long. Uh, started uh, 1948, if uh, I'm not wrong, uh, when uh, when Israel became a uh, state. Uh, my opinion is that uh, Israel is very harsh against Palestinians. Uh, I think that uh, Israel is taking the land for the from Palestinians and though that small small part of the land that they have now uh, Israel is uh, trying to to make their life uh, harder uh, so Israel is uh, controlling uh, the water supply the main uh, roads are also uh, under Israeli uh, control why there is no uh, Palestinian state and why is Israel so hard against the Palestinians in uh, that part of the world? The problem started in 1882, not in 1948. What happened then? The first Jews arrived from Russia and uh -huh. settled, in, uh, settled in Palestine under the auspices of a Zionist movement, or what became later the Zionist movement. They were called Bilu. From the first moment the Jews landed on the shores of Palestine at the time, and began to build colonies, the Arabs began to protest. Can I ask you short questions sure, which sure, sure, that sure. I'm not uh, familiar with? Sure. So you say 1882. Mm -hmm. uh, before that year, was there living any Jews in th that part of the world? Yes, but not many. Not many? Not many. Mm -hmm. The majority at the time were Arabs. And also not many Arabs. Uh, Palestine was pretty empty. It was so empty that Herzl, the father of Zionism, mistakenly believed that, that Palestine is empty, completely. And he believed it's a wasteland, it's an extension of the Sahara Desert, which technically it is. Mm -hmm. And so he said, you know, it's desert, and why not to reclaim it? It used to be our fatherland 2,000 years ago, why not reclaim it now? We are not damaging anyone, there's no one there, you know, mm -hmm. and so. It was, of course, a mistake. There were, there were anywhere between 100 and 170,000 Jews living there, mostly religious Orthodox Jews who stayed there because, because it used to be Palestine, it used to be Israel, the ancient land of Israel and so on. But there were about three or four times as much as many Arabs. When the first Jews arrived in 1982, the Arabs at the beginning thought that it's a positive development because they believe that the Jews are rich, like all anti-Semites, all anti-Semites believe that the Jews are rich, 
and they thought that uh, they thought that the Jews will bring with them jobs, money, credit, investments, and so on, and will employ the Arabs. Mm -hmm. So, in the beginning, the Arabs regarded it as a positive development. Well, let's st let's stop a little bit. You yes. say that everybody who thinks that uh, Jews are rich is anti-Semitic. Yes. yes. There are two types of anti-Semitism. The first type of anti-Semitism is the primitive type of anti-Semitism that says, you know, Jews are Jews are bacteria. They are. They are vermin. They should be exterminated. They are, etc., etc. This is a primitive type of. Uh, it's also religious type. The Jews killed uh, Jesus, and because they killed Jesus, they should be punished and for their deed. And so these are, um, let's say, middle age type, middle age type of uh, anti-Semitism, which extended to the beginning of the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, scientific anti-Semitism emerged, especially in uh, France and Germany. And anti-Semites began to say not the Jews are low-level uh, subhumans, but they began to say that the Jews are the real masters of the universe. Can I stop you once more? Mm. What, what were the origins of that hatred uh, to the Jews that they are, ver uh, we say, vermin, say, vermin say, bacteria, bacteria. bacteria? Why? Because of the religion? Religious? Or because uh, because Jews, of several, uh, because because of several of, uh, What happened to Jesus? Uh, yeah. First of all, there was the religious thing that the Jews uh, betrayed. Uh, bet I mean, according to the to the Bible, New Testament, the New Testament, yeah, which was written by people who were in themselves uh, either anti-Semites or trying to distinguish themselves from the Jews. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, the story was that the Jews betrayed or surrendered Jesus to the Romans. Technically, Jesus was not killed by the Jews. The Jews did not have a right to kill anyone. Only the Roman Empire could kill. And he was crucified, which is not a Jewish way of killing. In, in ancient Judea, the way of ma method of killing was stoning, with stones. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Crucifixion was purely Roman method of execution. So, even though historically it's not true, the perception was that the Jews surrendered Jesus to the Romans, and had they not done it, he would not have been executed. Uh, this was one source, but I think the, the more, the stronger force behind uh, medieval anti-Semitism was that the Jews themselves regarded themselves as a the chosen people. They separated themselves from the environment. In the Talmud we have hundreds of laws which dictate to us to separate ourselves from all other people. The other people are called Gentiles. What is Talmud? Talmud is our, is a, the compendium of our holy writings. Compendium of religious law, compendium of our folk tales, compendium of, our, of modes of conduct, how to behave. What, is it the Old Testament part of that Talmud? No, Old Testament is part of the Bible. Talmud came hundreds of years later. But the Old Testament is a, is a Jewish book, right? Old Testament was written by, by people who called themselves Hebrews. Mm -hmm. It is an open question whether the Hebrews of antiquity are the Jews of today. Still an open question. Mm -hmm. But assuming that they are, yes, then it's a Jewish book. Mm -hmm. But the New Testament is also a Jewish book. Jesus was a Jew. Oh, not yeah? denying that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Jesus was a Jew. All the disciples were Jews. They were all Jews. So what is a Jew then? Is a Jew religious uh, differential? Or? Jews, Jews are both a nationality and a religion. It's the only, it's the only case in, in, in the world. Can you be a Jew, uh, but an atheist in the same time? Of course, I'm a Jew and I'm uh, agnostic. Uh -huh. I don't believe in God. Uh -huh. I mean, I don't know if there is a God, but I definitely don't believe in God. I don't practice any religion whatsoever. So, uh, sorry for interrupting you. It's mm -hmm. very difficult for you. Yeah, can you, can you continue with the Talmud and the teaching that you should be separated? Yes. So the Talmud contains hundreds of uh, edicts, hundreds of hundreds of decrees and laws of behavior, uh, which instruct us to separate ourselves from people who are not Jewish. These people are called Gentiles. So we have laws that prohibit us to eat with such people. We are not allowed to eat with such people. We are not allowed to drink with them, even. How is, how is this different from uh, the teaching of uh, Hitler for the Arya, Arya race and things like that? It's not. It's not different? It's not different in the sense that the Jews believe that they are a separate race, that this race is chosen by God, and that this race should not mix with uh, with other people. Should maintain its purity. So, in these three, in these three dimensions, racism, modern racism, borrows from Judaism in effect, <laughs> and it's constructed on Judaism. However, the difference between Hitler and or, uh, Nazi Nazi racism and Jewish racism is that the Jews never claimed 
debt, uh, never claimed any privileges or prerogatives because they are the chosen people. They didn't say, we are the chosen people, so we should control Europe. We are the chosen people, so everyone should be our slaves, like Hitler. Hitler said, we are the chosen people, so we should be masters of Europe. We are the chosen people, so the Russians and Ukrainians and Polish should work for us, should be our slaves. Hitler took it a step further. Jews have no sense of entitlement. They feel that to be a chosen people is an obligation, not a right. It obliges you to behave in certain ways, to do certain things, to innovate, to invent things, to contribute to humanity's uh, progress and so on and so forth, but doesn't give you any rights, any special rights. Hitler was reversed. But still is a sick uh, point of view of the world, right? When it was invented, it was not very unusual. Now, in modern society, of course, it's a sick point of view. It's racist. It's racism. It's racism without entitlement, without any rights, but it's still racist, definitely. Now, modern Jews, the vast majority of Jews actually, I would say about 80%, 90% of Jews don't observe these laws. These laws are 2,000 years old. They don't observe it. These laws were invented at the time of Plato and Aristotle. So no one observes these laws. That's only in the books. Except 15% of the Jewish people, one five percent of the Jewish people, they are the Orthodox Jews that live in Jerusalem and in Satma uh, community in Brooklyn and, you know, in these places. These Jews observe these laws. You cannot drink. This Jew will not drink with you, except so, water. So you are saying that that was the reason because people hated them in the, in the 17th, 18th century and before When that? you see someone who refuses to drink with you, refuses to eat with you, is not allowed to marry your daughter, is not allowed to, to shake your hand, is, uh, you know, you feel normally insulted a bit. <laughs> so this separation, it is not true to say that the Jews were forced to be in a ghetto. The Jews chose to be in ghettos. Because the ghettos made it easier for them to observe these religious laws of not mixing with the Gentiles, you know. Do you think that this story people in the world knows? Not really, no. Not really, because immediately after the Holocaust, the Jews, and especially the Israelis, have rewritten history to pretend that whatever happened to them was other people's fault, that the ghettos were imposed on them, while actually they, they wanted to live in ghettos. That even in Istanbul, where the Jews were welcomed with open arms, they immediately established a ghetto. <laughs> you know, they were not, there was no restriction where they could live. But they established a ghetto. Why Istanbul uh, waited them with open arms? You want to say that the, Mus the Muslims didn't have problem with the Jews in the first time? Istanbul welcomed them because the Jews that came to Istanbul escaped from Spain. They were expert administrators, bureaucrats and bankers. Istanbul at the time, the Ottomans were just establishing their empire. It was 1492. And so the Ottomans wanted expertise very much, and they respected the Jews enormously, and so they opened the Sajjum. Also, the, the, another reason is because uh, Muslims didn't have problem with the Jews about the crucifixion of Jesus, those things, you know. Muslim, Muslims have uh, Muslims, uh, Muslims have something called uh, uh, Ahlil Kitab, that means the people of the book. Muslims recognize all the previous figures in religious history as their own prophets. They recognize Abraham, which is a Jew, as their prophet. They recognize Jesus as a prophet of Islam. Jesus is a prophet of Islam. His name in Islam is Isa. So Muslims are actually building on previous religions. They believe that Muhammad just completed the process, but he could not have completed it without previous. Mm -hmm. So Islam is the all-encompassing religion. It's a religion that includes Judaism. Includes, it's an inclusive religion, not exclusive religion. Consequently, they have something called Ahl al-Kitab. That means the people of the book, the people who invented previous religions that now are part of Islam. And they give such people special privileges. They give the Christians, whom they call Messianic. They give Messianics special privileges. They give Jews special but. In Islamic countries, Ahl al-Kitab, the Jews and the Christians, are also the man. They are also second-class citizens. Second-class citizens. The man in Islam must be protected by the regime, by religious law. The Quran says that if you have the man, second-class citizens, among you, the Quran says to the Muslims, you should protect these people. You should not kill them. You should not torture them, you should not. So the Muslims always protected their minorities. That's why there is a Jewish minority in Iran? 
and nothing happened? Everywhere, you? yes. The Muslims always protect their minorities because of the Quran's instruction to protect minorities who live among them. You must distinguish the minorities that live inside Islam and the people who live outside Islam, these are called infidels. The people, so you have Christians living inside Islam, they're protected. Okay. But Christians living outside the borders of that very country mm -hmm. are to be killed. To be killed? To be killed. Why? Din Muhammad be safe. The law of Muhammad will be delivered through the sword. It is the obligation of, of Islam to spread itself and to convert everyone. And if you do not accept Muhammad as the true courier, as the true messenger of God, then you take a risk of getting killed in one of the jihads. And if you were a Muslim and you converted to another religion, you're dead. There is automatic fatwa, automatic religious edict on all Muslims who what, convert to what other religions. if religion. you become an atheist? You can, no, if you become an atheist, something else. But if you become, you, from Muslim, you become Christian. Mm -hmm. That is, that is uh, decent. I think that this kind of uh, thinking also have the Christ Christian people about the Jews. They think that Christians are uh, Jews on the higher level. Who? Uh, Ann Coulter said that. You, you know Ann Coulter? Yes. The Republican... Uh, no, but who is on higher level of what? I didn't understand Christians that. are actually Jews on higher level. Mm. Because they, you yeah. know, Old Testament, New Testament, no, that's yeah. why... They are the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's a Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. So many of the evangelicals in the United States and other fundamentalists and, and uh, Protestant sects and so on, they call themselves Beit Israel, the House of Israel. They say that uh, when the apocalypse will come, when doomsday, when the apocalypse will come and so on, after that, there will be one House of Israel. Mm -hmm. All those who believe in, in, in Judaism and, and Christianity will become one. Mm -hmm. So they think that Jews are temporarily Jews. It's a question of time before they see the light. And, and become Christians. And become Christians. Uh -huh. But it's necessary for them to remain Jews until the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Because the, the prophecies in the Old Bible, in the Old uh, Testament, talk about the Jews, not about Christians. Uh -huh. So we must have Jews in Israel, because so the apocalypse will happen in Israel. Armageddon and so on will happen in Israel. There, Jews must be. So they regard the establishment of the State of Israel as the fulfillment of the prophecy. The first step in the apocalypse. They say, fundamentalist Christians say, that the establishment of the state of Israel was preordained in the Bible, in the prophecy, because without a uh, Jewish state, there could be no apocalypse. So this, as this answer my next question I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, you said that in 1882, the Jews from Russia came to Israel, because uh, Ru why Russian Empire didn't want them? Russian Empire was pretty primitive. This, uh, this was a country of peasants and so on, and medieval anti-Semitism was very strong there. Because of those those things that you Religious said, because, because, because the Jewish yeah. wanted to be separate. Yeah, all the things yeah, that yeah, I mentioned. Yeah. There, there, mm -hmm. the only place actually where medieval anti-Semitism survived was Russia. It did not survive in Germany, it did not survive in France. In Germany and France there was scientific anti-Semitism, but not medieval. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Scientific anti-Semitism was economic anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. The Jews are too strong, they control the banking system, pa pa pa, you know. Economic. Um, racists like genetic anti-semitism but based on science once i read uh, on uh, internet that uh, the british uh, prime minister uh, <coughs> israeli he's one of the famous uh, prime ministers in uh, uk he didn't support macedonians uh, in 1903 1903 for uh, you know our bostania Bostania, Ilinian rising mm -hmm. because uh, he wanted to support Turkey because the Turkey was friendly with the Jews. So he, he didn't want to support Macedonians because he at he th that time he think that with that he would support Russia and Russia was anti-Semitic. I think Very you are referring to Herzl. Yes? Yes, I don't think it was the Israeli. Um, I think it was Benjamin the Israeli. I think he was a bit dead by the time. But uh, Herzl, who established Zionism, mm -hmm. really tried to May, uh, create a special relationship with uh, with the Pota, with the Sultan. Mm -hmm. He actually met the Sultan. And uh, well, what was Herzog in that time? Herzog. 
Herzl. What, Herzl. What, what was he then? Herzl invented. Uh, he was a journalist, and he, he from UK or from America? No, no, he was uh, from uh, from uh, Germany. From Germany? Yes, mm -hmm. he was uh, actually in Hungary, technically. Mm -hmm. Uh, part of the Austrian Empire that mm -hmm. was transferred to Germany back in, in Europe it's meaningless to ask where from because he was uh, very yeah. uh, powerful journalist Herzl? yes he was writing for Die Presse Die Presse was a very prominent Viennese Austrian mm -hmm. newspaper and one day he was sent to cover the Dreyfus trial in France that was a trial against a Jewish officer who was accused of espionage in favor of the Germans but actually today we know that it was a frame-up, uh, Dreyfus didn't do anything. He was simply the highest ranking Jewish officer and the others were jealous of him because he was a Jew. And they framed him up, they falsified evidence, and it was a bloody mess. The government in France fell three times. Emile Zola wrote Jacuzzi, the famous... Uh, and so Herzl was sent by the press, eh? the press was owned by a Jew. Herzl, of course, Herzl was sent by the press to cover the Dreyfus trial. When he witnessed the crowd shouting death to the Jews, we will drink the blood of the Jews and outside the court. Mm -hmm. And when he saw the miscarriage of justice against Dreyfus, mm -hmm. who by the way did not consider himself a Jew at all, uh, Herzl woke, woke up. He said, there is no future for the Jews in Europe. We must re-establish our old fatherland, homeland, mm -hmm. and go back there because no one wants us. That, that was the question I wanted to ask you all, the, all this time, half an hour. Why? America was not the chosen country for uh, Israel because uh, there is one million people who live in New York and they, they feel wonderful there. Yeah. Why, why there is a need for Israel? Maybe because you said because of the Bible that Americans also needed uh, Israel no, no. for the Armageddon or no. things like that? First of all, the vast major majority of Jews went to America, not to Israel. About uh, three million Jews went to America, not to Israel. Even in 1948, the Jews in Israel, in Palestine, were 650,000 people. That's all. So in 50 years of Zionism and six years of Holocaust, still only half a million Jews came to Palestine. They didn't want to go there. It was a shithole. Swamps, mosquitoes, Arabs. I mean, who wanted to go there? It was a mess. At the very beginning, Herzl did not want to go to Palestine at all. He wanted to go to Madaga Madagascar. He was negotiating with the British to give him Madagascar. Well, why not America? Why not, America, why, America why not had a, a small country inside of yeah, America. Yeah, America had a quota. They had what? Quota. 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 They did not allow Jews more than a certain number. Oh, no, that that was the reason. That was the reason. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted to go to America, of course, but America had a quota, so it was unrealistic. So what he was doing, he was negotiating with Britain for Madagascar. With how many Jews were there in the rural in that time when they were uh, trying to make Israel? In 1939, before the Holocaust, there were 18 million Jews. 18 million. 18 million. In 1939. And after the Holocaust. <laughs> it's like easy, no? 30. 18 minus 6. Minus 6. Yeah, 12. 12. 12 million. When, wh which were the countries that they lived the most? Before the Holocaust? Before the Holocaust. Before the Holocaust, the biggest concentration was in Russia and Poland. And second biggest in America, USA. Uh, what about Africa, Asia, Australia? No, almost not. Almost not. No? Almost not. There were Jews in China, 100 Jews. Mm -hmm. There were Jews everywhere, but the biggest. Mm -hmm. Hitler. I'll give you one more question. Sorry, yeah. when the when the Jews started to go to America, in the same in time uh, with the English or much later? Uh, uh, when the pogroms, there were pogroms, riots in Russia uh, in the 1870s uh -huh. against Jews, and then started the first wave. Mm -hmm. There was the first wave mm -hmm. between 1870 and 1910. Close to three million Jews. Went, went, to, to went to America and Americans were... And most of them in New York, in, New York, in, most of them in Boston. In, New York, yes. in Boston. Most of them in New York. After that, many of them moved to California, but Americans were shocked and they uh, uh, imposed quotas. They were shocked by the... By the influx of... Uh, uh -huh. you know, these Jews were uneducated peasants, very poor, uh, with diseases, with, so Americans were absolutely shocked. And they... So, so you surprised me, because maybe I'm anti-Semitic also, because I always thought that they were always educated and always rich. No, no, no. The vast majority of all students all students means Jews of the East. The vast majority of all students were poor. Actually, they were poorer than the general population. They were poor. They were mostly uneducated, except minor, I mean, basic knowledge of Hebrew. How do you then explain the biggest, the big success that they had in America if they were not educated? They did not have any big success. They, they remained in very bad conditions. They were small-time traders, and you can see the slums and the ghettos in movies even. They were not a success. 
the German Jews were a success. <coughs> there were a few hundred thousand German Jews, British Jews, and so on. So there were about a million Jews there who were enormous success. They established actually the investment industry. Goldman, Sachs are two Jews. They established the investment industry, established the film industry. I mean, established the, sorry, not the film industry, the investment industry, the publishing industry, and so on. When the old student came, the East Jews, the, the Jews from the West, Germany especially, hated the Jews from the East. They were disgusted by them and they felt humiliated and embarrassed that both of them are Jews. So they refused to associate we, with them. We don't know about this. We, yeah. we thought always the Jews are always together. No, first of all, they're not together because you have Sephardim and Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim are Jews from Europe and Sephardim are Jews from Asia, Balkans, uh, Africa. Well, well, what is the difference between them? The Sephardim are Jews mostly who escaped from Spain and spread all over, mainly Turkey, mm -hmm. North Africa, mm -hmm. and Balkans, mm -hmm. and so on. The Ashkenazi Jews are mainly Jews from from uh, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, Russia, Poland, these Ashkenazi. Mm -hmm. Sephardi and Ashkenazi are almost two distinct nationalities. Almost. We have nothing in common. Not the way we pray, not this, our songs, not nothing. Completely. What about the, the, the religious books? Are the same? Yes, we're using the same religious books, but so, do, so, does, uh, so do Christians. But you cannot compare, compare Mormons to Presbyterians. Yes. They're using the same books, but I mean, Mormons maybe not, okay. Presbyterians mm -hmm. and Catholics. Well, what are you? Sephard? I'm Sephardi. Mm -hmm. I'm Sephardi. My father is from Morocco. Mm -hmm. My mother is from Turkey. Mm -hmm. I'm Sephardi. Mm -hmm. So you have this distinction, Ashkenazi Sephardi. Then you have Orthodox Jews and all the rest. Modern Jews. Then you have West uh, Then Europe, you have West Jews and East Austria, Europe. of course. There are many divisions. Many. So what happened with the East uh, Europe Jews when they came in America? They came. They were very poor. They were uneducated. And they were dirty. They the were other Jews didn't want them. They didn't want them. So what all. happened with them? They gave charity to keep them away. And that was it. So the old student uh, built their own ghettos where they s survived somehow. You know, they were Hasidic. So they had movements. They lived on charity in, in essence. But the more entrepreneurial ones moved out of New York. And they established the film industry in California, for instance. Cinema industry, right? Cinema industry, yes, yes in California, for example. So the Hollywood actually is a Jewish invention. Uh, yeah, there. Austrian from from the east. Mm -hmm. There isn't a single one there from Germany or they're all East, Ju east Jews from Russia, mainly. Mm -hmm. So these are these are the dynamics of and, and now many Jews from Russia escaped to America and so on, but some of them were Zionists or not Zionists, but they were in love with the old, uh, with antiquity, antiquizatia, like Macedonia, mm -hmm. Alexander the Great, you know. Mm -hmm. So they were, they wanted uh, to re-establish the fatherland that existed 2,000 years ago, and they read the Bible, and... So let's explain uh, shortly, if you want, please, uh, yeah. what is Zionism? Can you give, give me uh, some definition for that? For that uh, Zionism is a derivative of the word Zion. Zion is the ancient name for the Jewish kingdom uh, of Judea. Zionism is the belief the Jews are not wanted anywhere, that their life is at risk if they stay outside their own country, and that therefore they should establish their own country, and go and concentrate there, and live there, and, li and exit all the other localities all over the world. Zionism proved to be prophetic and Christian, be Christian because Zionism said if the Jews don't leave Europe, some huge catastrophe will happen. They're like, right. Like, how? like Holocaust. Holocaust happened 50 years after Zionism. So they, so they, they pre predicted. They predicted. Yeah, they predicted correctly. They said we are so hated, and the hatred is just accumulating, just accumulating. We must hurry. We must escape from Europe and establish our own country. Otherwise, something horrible will happen. So Hitler uh, used that hatred to build a story about that. Hitler is a very special case. Very, very special case. Against again the history of Judaism in, especially in Europe, the history of the Nazi movement. The history of the Holocaust was, how to put it gently, rewritten for political purposes. The Jews realized that using the Holocaust as a leverage, they can obtain their own country. Uh -huh. Everyone feels guilty that uh -huh. they did not help the Jews. Mm -hmm. They will use this guilt complex mm -hmm. to obtain benefits. Uh -huh. So they got billions of dollars from Germany, they got uh, the State of Israel from the United Nations, they got whatever do, they could. Do you think that they didn't deserve those millions? No, no, no. I'm not saying they didn't... I don't know what they deserve. There's no deserve in politics. What you can get, you get. You know? Yes. But what I'm saying is that they had to rewrite big parts of history. And so today, the official history is not correct. 
Simply which which parts are not correct? Many. Let's consider Hitler, for instance. Okay. Hitler is presented as a guy, someone, who, when he lived in Vienna, witnessed the Austrian, the Jews from the East, who, by the way, flocked to Vienna. They went to Vienna, and they really were there, and they were uneducated, dirty, ugly, and so on, involving crime, disproportionately, like any minority that has nothing to do with. It. So Hitler saw these Jews there. That's the official version. And he had an epiphany, he had a realization that the Jews are the source of all the trouble and the chaos and the bad things that happen in the world. And that to cure the world, especially Europe, you must eradicate the Jews. That's the official story that you can read in textbooks. I thought that the, the official story is that, uh, that uh, Hitler was angry about the Jews because they, they had the banks. And they yeah, after that he, after that he expl uh, after they explained that the Jews control all the, that there are two types of Jews uh -huh, uh -huh. the Jews that control all the banks and control America and control the United Kingdom and so on and the Jews that are controlling prostitution and gambling and, and so on and so in, in whatever way you wherever you 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 look they are bad to the world okay the true story is that Hitler admired the Jews he admired them Hitler said that there are only two nations in the world. The, the, who are supreme, who are at the top. And that the history of the world is a battle between these two nations. Whoever will win will eradicate this the other. This story, nobody knows this story. First time I'm hearing this. Yes, this is the truth, unfortunately. Wait a minute, by the time I finish you will you will hear many things you never heard before. Because really it's very difficult to so come So basically up. the fight between the Germans and Jews are actually the fight between two supreme races? Supreme races. The fight between two supreme races equal to each other. That's why he wanted to, to exterminate all, yes. all of them. Not because he thought they were inferior, because why would you exterminate them? So you, you can use it, right? Like a, like yeah, a slave. Slaves, this, this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why, why to exterminate it? He wanted to exterminate it because he said it's, it's we or them. Uh. No other option. Or we survive or they survive. And in his will, he says, in the will that he dictated to Martin Bowman on the 28th of April, he says, we, the Aryans, failed. It is the turn of the Jews. And I instruct the Aryans to kill, continue to kill the Jews because their existence is at risk. He was convinced that the Jews control... He was convinced Roosevelt was a Jew. He thought well, was, he was, he, was he paranoid practically? Yes, of course he was paranoid and sick in the head and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, absolutely. But in his mind, not, it's not the Jews were inferior. The but Jews he, he were, admired them. He admired them. Yeah. No, almost, almost too much. Too much. That was the source of his paranoia. That's why I say that to say that the Jews control the world is anti-Semitism. Hitler was this kind of anti-Semite. Okay. Hitler at the beginning had no uh, no intention whatsoever to kill the Jews. It Wait is true. Now you say that he, he wanted to kill them because he admired them. Not at the beginning. Not at the, no, no, the beginning. Not at the beginning. Till uh, at the beginning, the concept was not to kill the Jews but to throw throw them out of Europe, to, to ethnically cleanse, cleanse Europe. He wanted to <coughs> assemble all the Jews and throw them out of Europe. Wasn't he afraid that maybe he will, they will make some kind of empire that will actually be... He was not interested in uh, anything except Europe. He, he was actually, Hitler actually was not interested in anything except East Europe. Hitler wanted to conquer... The thing was that Germany was very late to the period of empires. The British had an empire for 200 years. The Belgians had an empire for 150 years. Spain, Everyone, Spain, Portugal, Portugal except Germany. Italy? No? Italy, in Abyssinia, and mm -hmm. Ethiopia and so on. Mm -hmm. Only nation in Europe which did not have any empire, effectively, effective empire, uh, was Germany. How that happened? Just a historical fact? Uh, 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 start, start coincidental? Start with the fact that there was no Germany before 1870. Germany was established in 1870, and before that, there were 330 uh, principalities, municipalities, yeah, and so on, and mm -hmm. Russia was the own country, and so mm -hmm. So when they united in 1870, then became Germany. Each of these principalities had some holdings. They had some holdings in Africa, but there was no coherent, cohesive, contiguous empire. Mm -hmm. So there was inferiority complex for the Germans. Everyone had empires. They so they decided, because Africa was blocked, Asia was blocked. Everywhere there were claims. There was no free space. So what you're trying to say is that Germany is the only country that didn't benefit uh, from 
colonialism. From colonialism. Yes. So how would, how are they rich then? So Hitler's idea. How how, how did they have uh, money if they didn't uh, took the, the gold or so Hitler's idea? Hitler's idea. If we cannot have an empire outside Europe, let's have an empire inside Europe. If we cannot enslave the Africans, let's enslave the Slavs. So his idea was to co to make an empire inside Europe. In this sense, he was a revolutionary. Every European was thinking how to make an empire outside Europe. He said, why do we have to go outside Europe? Let me conquer Ukraine, let me conquer Russia, let me conquer... And I will establish an empire there. Same principle. You yeah. conquer other nations yeah. and fuck them. Yeah, but, but all the other Europeans said, but these are white people. Russians are white people. Oh. Ukrainians are white people. You can conquer black people, but not Asian people. Yeah. But not white. Wow. Hitler said, wait a minute. Even within white people, there are superior white people and on untermenschen, subhuman white people. Hitler, the joke, was less racist than the British. Because the British said all white women, uh, men, are superior to black men. And Hitler said, not true. There are some white men, people, who are equal to Africans, uh, Russians, they are equal, uh, Pol Polish people. For me, they are the same like Africans. So the joke is that, in a way, Hitler was less racist than British. So he invented the concept of Aryan. He didn't invent it, he borrowed it from Chamberlain, Treitschke and others. He, he said, okay, we must, we must conquer Lebensraum. We must conquer a living space. And where, where can we conquer? Africa is busy, Asia is occupied, there is nowhere. We, we must go east. Hitler had no interest, not in the United Kingdom. And not. Actually, Hitler offered to the United Kingdom early on a deal. You will let us conquer Russia and Ukraine, and we will not touch any possession of the British Empire. But the British rejected this. They rejected it? Rejected. Why? They rejected it because they be the British believed in a balance of powers in Europe. Uh -huh. Whenever one force in Europe came too much, they intervened. Uh -huh. Same with Napoleon. Uh -huh. Napoleon also. Napoleon was the predecessor of Hitler. And if you read books written about Napoleon 50 years after he died, he was described like Hitler. Vicious, evil men, Satan, and so on. Maybe 50 years from now, Hitler will not be considered so bad. Nap Napoleon wanted to also to conquer Russia to of be... Of course, he to went to Russia in 1812. Yeah. Uh -huh. Also, to, there was no oil then, but there was uh, my spaces. mines... Uh, spaces, spaces, agriculture, coal, yeah, yeah, coal. Yes, yes. Yeah. Everyone went to Russia. All the big uh, conquerors went to mm -hmm. Russia. Everyone from Gingis Khan to mm -hmm. Tamerlan to everyone went to Russia. Russia is, uh, I'm, not, I'm, sure, I'm not sure Alexander is, is went to Russia. No? Alexander did not go to Russia because he, there was no concept of Russia. There was no Russia. Mm -hmm. He went to India, then Russia, India, so. mm -hmm. Persia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Hitler is not an exception in any way. He just continued the tradition of Napoleon and so. On. But the, the, the innovation that he introduced into political affairs was to say. Some uh, white people, for me, mm -hmm. are the same like Africans. Mm -hmm. And that was revolution. That shocked. Is it wrong to say that Hitler uh, watched the English people as brothers or things like that? No. No? He no? Thought, no. He thought that English uh, people are inferior to mm -hmm. pure Aryans. He called, them, he called them a nation of grocery uh, people with podavnity. Uh -huh, uh -huh. A nation of grocers. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm. But he regarded the Scandinavians as Aryans. Yes? Yes, completely Aryans. So because the British uh, nation is consists of Norman... Mixed. Yeah. Mixed, no, 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 French. No, French, yeah. Yeah. French and, yeah. So for them, he, he, they were like second tier. What he think about French? Same, second tier. Second tier. He o said only, the, only the Scandinavians were... Yes, Scandinavians, Germans, Fils, some Germans, Fils. some Germans. Mm -hmm. Not all Germans, by the way, some Germans. And he, he said that... Uh, he said that uh, the French mix too much with blacks. And so on. Anyhow. Was he a Jew also? No. The, the Hitler? Completely. Complete nonsense. Nonsense? Nonsense. Okay. okay. The reason for this speculation that he was a Jew is because his great uh, grandmother worked for a very rich Jew and got pregnant while she worked for the Jew. And there were rumors at the time that she got pregnant by the son of the Jew. And so she was the great grandmother, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the grandmother, mm -hmm. great grandmother of Hitler, grandmother of his father. Uh -huh. So, but no one knew. So, 
so let's go with the talk now. You said that in the first time he didn't want to kill the Jews. And what Hitler, happened then? Hitler did not care about other empires. He did not care about the United States. He did not want to declare war about the, uh, with the, on the United States. Japan forced it. He is concentrated on Russia and Ukraine. If he was left alone, he would have gone only. He would not have gone west. He would not have gone to Belgium, to France. To, he would have gone directly to the east, to Russia and Ukraine, and would, he would have toppled Stalin. I keep saying that it was a serious mistake that the West supported Stalin against Hitler. What? Why? Because what they should have done, they should have left, let these two sadist maniacs kill each other. They should have left, left Stalin to destroy Hitler and Hitler to destroy Stalin. And the West would have come and taken everything. Why to support one complete maniac against another complete maniac? They were both homicidal maniacs. It's not that one was superior to another. They were both men. So what you're saying is it was wrong that the British, uh, the truce with the Stalin before Second World War. And the Americans saw that. The Americans until 1941 did not want to enter the war in, in Europe. They said let them kill each other. You know, they saw that. That was good uh, decision by the yes, Americans. Yes, I think the West should have, I mean, the United Kingdom should have made an agreement with Hitler. Mm -hmm. Russia is yours, Ukraine is yours, do what you want. But even Hitler made the truce with Stalin, you remember? Of truth? course, Hitler made, he had no choice. The West declared war on him. Ah, he conquered why. Poland. He conquered Poland. France declared war. Um, uh, British, Britain declared war because of the balance of powers. Yes, that was the reason why. Yes, which was a 19th century concept, mm -hmm. it's an old concept, not applicable to modern warfare. So the, the British didn't have a reason to afraid from Hitler. No, he would, he didn't want to never to go to England. No, or no way. He was not interested in Britain at all. He was not even interested in France. It's a fact that when he conquered France. He withdrew from the big, big part of France, and he maintained a small enclave, which was called the, uh, uh, the Occupied Zone. The vast majority of France was free. Mm -hmm. There were no Germans there. Mm -hmm. It was controlled by a government in Vichy. Mm -hmm. He had no interest in France, none. Mm -hmm. But he had no choice. There were I mean, the Stalin was the big threat to Europe, not Hitler. Why was the hatred of uh, Hitler against Russians so so huge? Russians had culture, they had uh, he did writers... Not hate them at, he did not hate them at all. No, why he thought that for them that they are so... Low level. Yeah. Because they were low level. <laughs> when the Russian Revolution took place in 1917, 97.8% of the population were working as, uh, in the village, in farmers, as farmers, agriculture. There was w less than 1.2% in industry. And the um, rate of literacy in uh, Russia was less than 40%. It was an inferior people by any standard. In the same time, how the Germans lived? They had uh, oh, much. Everything industry much and everything? Of course, of course. Germans had, uh, if you count Czech Republic into, into it, Germans controlled about 70% of all coal deposits. They had 40% of all mines in Europe. They had 45% of steel production in Europe. They had uh, uh, six of every ten major universities, etc. Et Germans were very high level. Mm -hmm. So he compared. Them. So he wanted to send the Jews out out of Europe. He yes. Why that? Why Unequivocally, that? yes. What the, the Jews will tell you otherwise because they so want to destroy the So basically, the, the, the Hitler was the, some kind of Zionist also. He Wait wanted to send them. We're coming Israel. to that. We're coming to okay. that. Okay. Uh, so Hitler said, "Let's get, let's clean Europe." Because I'm interested in Europe, I'm interested in Africa. Eh? Let's clean Europe, just take the Jews and throw them out. Even he was thinking, let's establish a small area, not so small, pretty big actually, much bigger than Israel, mm -hmm. area in Poland, near the city of Lublin. And let's take all the Jews, temporarily put them there. No, we'll not touch them, we'll just put them there. And from there we'll begin to move them to where we decide to put them. So there was an idea to put them in Madagascar. And so on. Nazi officials were flying all over. They were flying to Madagascar to inspect the land and the weather and so on. They, they went to Lublin, including Heinrich Himmler, uh, the ice sphere of the SS, went to Lublin several times and reported back to Hitler, uh, Otto Frank, all the big uh, Nazi officials were seriously engaged for many years. Were they thinking about Israel? They, they, yes, Eichmann went to Israel to visit. But the British made clear that they are not interested. Oh, the British said no. The British but said yes, no. the Nazis asked. And well into 1941, 
there was no intention to kill the Jews. It's a fact that all the concentration camps for Jews and the extermination camps were established in between 1940 and 1942, not before. Why they were not established in 1936? There was no plan to kill the Jews. So Hitler tried in many ways to find a place for the Jews. No one wanted them. They approached the Americans, no. British, no. Madagascar, no. No one wanted them. Why nobody wanted them? Because they, wa they wanted to help the Jews to stay in Europe? Or they hated in the same level like this, this guy hated? Hated the same level. You can see memoranda written by Roosevelt advisors and, uh, ch and advisors to Churchill and so on that sound worse than Nazi propaganda. <laughs> Seriously? Worse than Nazi propaganda. <laughs> Even after the war, mm -hmm. British ministers said, well, we don't condone the methods that he used, but we fully understand his motivation. <laughs> no one wanted the Jews. And Hitler was okay with that also. He said, okay, no one wants them, I will put them in ghettos at this stage and we'll see what happens. But then he conquered Poland with three million Jews. And he began to conquer Belarus uh, in 1941, in June, he invaded Russia. And he added another three million Jews. And he said, wait a minute, that's... I did not predict this. I mean, I, I was able to cope with uh, 800,000 German Jews and you know, a million Jews in France, but I, I'm not... I'm not ready in the Reich to have 15 million Jews or 10 million Jews. This out of the question. The Reich will be polluted. He used this word. And the official policy was Judenrein, clean of Jews, not without Jews, clean of Jews. Rein means to clean, to cleanse, mm -hmm. to clean with the water. With the mm -hmm. So he said the Jews are dirty, they pollute whatever they touch and but so But you said he admired them. Admired them. This is their way of gaining control. Mm -hmm. With dirty methods. That's their way of fighting. Mm -hmm. The Aryans fight clean and to the uh, straight like gentlemen. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The Jews fight dirty. Uh -huh, that's right. But they're equal. They're equally powerful, equally mm -hmm. to be admired. And fighting for control but of the world. But because he was killing in those camps also the Slavs and the, the homosexuals and the gypsies, right? True. Mm -hmm. But uh, e each one for different reasons. He didn't regard any of them as a race. Mm -hmm. The gypsies, by the way, were protected until 1942 by Heinrich Himmler because the official policy was that the gypsies were the original Aryans. The, in race theory in Nazi Germany, the gypsies were the original Aryans because they came from India. And the Aryans came from India. Until 1942, then there was a change in perception. Wait a minute, the, uh, I thought the Aryans are black, uh, white. Gypsies original, are black. Original Aryans come from, from um, India. No, 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 it's not a question of black and white. There is an ideal Aryan type, but Hitler was not exactly uh, blonde, yes? So you're saying that uh, the Germans thought for the first time that gypsies are the yes. real Aryans? until 1942, because they came from India, where the Aryans originated. This, was, this is very surprising. For yes. Me. Well, that's why you have Indo-European languages. Indo-European. Because uh -huh. it's all from India. Uh -huh. So they said the Aryans came from India, mm -hmm. the gypsies came from India, so they are Aryans. There was a big debate until 1942, and until 1942 they were not touched by order of Einstein. And then? Then in 1942 it was decided that they are actually not Aryans. There was a big debate. On, there mm -hmm. were, don't ask, there were museums and conferences and tribunals. And oh, they were talking about this oh, in Germany, yeah. right? Racism was the main theory. It was like today, I don't know, relativity theory or democracy. Or, or ecology or, or something. Ecology, yes. Yeah, exactly. There were NGOs. In, there were in, so you are saying that in, in German universities, of course, they were talking about how what faculties to do of racism, and of course, books, and books, everything. libraries, museums where they kept skeletons of Jews and everything. It was a whole industry. They so this was this was not the solely project of Hitler, mm -hmm. but the whole society was but involved only, in that. But not only in Germany, Hitler did not invent anything. The biggest racist in European history is a British Chamberlain. Hitler borrowed from him, and uh, well, he was a professor. Somewhere? Professor, I mean, yes, academic. He made he had some kind of books which are yes, uh, yes. anti-Semitic. Yeah, not anti-Semitic, racist. racist. Chamberlain said the of racist. Chamberlain said that the, the actually the English are the main the Aryan race. No, he, he he invented the concept of Aryan, but he was British, mm -hmm. not German at all. Uh, second second most important racist was the French. Who's that guy? French. He was uh, writing Lagarde. He was writing in journalist. Mm -hmm. So the origins of scientific anti-Semitism are not German at all. They are imported from outside Germany. This is because Hitler was exposed. Hitler was very cosmopolitan. 
it's highly unusual among Germans. People say, oh, this Hitler was stupid. He was not so stupid. He's a guy who traveled all over Europe. That was very rare with Germans. Germans were born in a village and they m traveled maximum 20 kilometers. They were very local patriotic. They were. Mm -hmm. Hitler was not like that. He was Bohemian. He traveled to, to Vienna, he traveled to Paris, he, traveled, he was all over the place. So he was open to ideas, he was open to, he was reading a lot, he was crazy about reading. But in his mind, mm. he didn't he didn't thought for himself that he's a bad guy because uh, British uh, were uh, doing the same thing to the Africans and to yes. the Asians. Yes, he, he said, he, did, he, yeah. he, said to himself, he said the Slavs yes, are the Africans yeah, of Europe. Yeah, yeah. So I cannot conquer Africa, it's finished, and so I'll go. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he, when he became councillor, when he became prime minister, among his first actions, was to tell the British, you know, leave me alone. Are we also the racist because we hate Hitler more than the British? Because we say, ah, British are not so bad, they kill only black people. But we hate Hitler because he he killed white people and Russians. Are we the racist in the same time? I don't know why you hate uh, Hitler. Why don't you hate Stalin? Stalin killed more people than Hitler. More white people than Hitler. White people don't hate Stalin, I don't understand that. I, if I had to choose in nine, I, I'm a Jew. Hitler killed one third of my people, but I'm telling you, that if I had to choose between Hitler and Stalin, I would have chosen Hitler. Hitler was far closer to European traditions than Stalin. Stalin was a Mongol. I don't know what to describe him, this guy. He was from Georgia. He was Asian. He was Central Asian. Mm -hmm. He's not European. Stalin is not European in any sense of the word. And you saw that after Hitler was... And Hitler was the only protection between Europe and Stalin. You saw that after Hitler fell, Stalin conquered Europe. You suffered Stalin. Was Stalin, was Stalin anti-Semitic? Yes, I believe. Why Trotsky worked for him then? Trotsky did not work for him. He killed, he assassinated Trotsky. But in the first time they were together with no. Lenin, no? Stalin worked for Trotsky, not the other one. Yes? Yes. Trotsky was uh, Minister of the War. In well, let me then uh, yeah. ask the other question. Maybe the question was wrong. Were the communists, Bolsheviks, anti-Semitic? Lenin and uh, That Trotsky. would have been difficult because most of them were Jews. <laughs> A bit Lenin also? Lenin was half Jew, uh, quarter Jew. Mm -hmm. uh, his wife was Jew. What was what were their policy against Jews? They had no policy, they were Jews. So they were friendly with Jews, right? They were all Jews. Mm -hmm. Why should we be friendly with themselves? They were Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of uh, of uh, the 15 most important communists who, who created the Russian Revolution and so on, up until 1932, of the 15 most important, 11 were Jews. So. I have Stalin was exception. Can he I, was surrounded can, by Jews. Can I ask you, because you're also an economical advisor and expert, can I ask you about the communism a little bit? Uh, you, th you think it's a jump from the story, or I can ask you a little you bit about... You can ask anything you want, uh, as long as you're having fun, enjoy. Would you yeah. like? mm. uh, what do you think, uh, why the Jews supported uh, the revolution? In Russia? Yeah. Why not to support the revolution? They, because they, the were also, they were always businessmen, they wanted to but the they capitalism. Were, no, first of all, I, I told you, the, the Jews in Russia were poor, uneducated, Celiacy. Mm -hmm. They were not businessmen. There was not a single Jewish businessman there, mm -hmm. except uh, Hirsch, who was German. Mm -hmm. So the Jews were a suppressed minority. The pogroms, the riots, anti Semitic literature. Jews were not allowed to study in university. There was something called numerous clauses. Only a tiny percentage of the student body were allowed to be Jews. Jews were not allowed to practice many professions like advocate. Jews were not allowed to live in, in most parts of Russia. So the Russian so society was uh, really, Tsarist. really anti-Semitic? Tsarist. Mm -hmm. Tsarist, the Tsar, was heavily anti-Semitic. He was heavily influenced by religious figures such as Rasputin, who were definitely anti-Semitic because the Orthodox Church in Russia was anti-Semitic because the Jews killed Jesus. And mm -hmm. So why not? I mean, of course the Jews... So the Jews supported the revolution because they the hated Jews invented the, the, the revolution. Tsar. They did not support the revolution. They invented They invented the revolution. Marx was a Jew. Marx was a Jew. Trotsky was a Jew. Lenin quarter Jew. His wife Jew. Uh, uh, you name it. Kirov was a Jew. But of 15, 11 were Jews. Also the general Zhukov? Zhukov was not a Jew. Mm -hmm. But he was general. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the, the figures that mm -hmm. made the revolution. Mm -hmm. They were Jews. Stalin was exceptional. They were mocking him because he was Celiac from Georgia. Mm -hmm. He was exceptional. And until 1932, the majority were Jews. Mm -hmm. Stalin had tried here; there, he couldn't. Let's back to the, to the story about when Hitler decided to to change the the the, the plan. So he decided, okay, now I have uh, many many millions of Jews. I have to kill them. Yes, he said that 
when they realize that they have just conquered six million Jews in Russia and mm -hmm. Poland, mm -hmm. I mean within two years, they said that's too much. There's no way for us to move six million Jews out of Europe, even if we want. Even if Britain says tomorrow, okay, we will move them. It's war. There was war. Don't forget. Trains cannot pass. Airplanes cannot. No, which way to transport them? With donkeys? What? There's no way. Mm -hmm. The minute they realized there is no way to solve the Jewish problem without killing them, they decided to kill them. There was a conference in Van Zee. Van Zee is a suburb of Berlin. There was a conference called the Con B Van Zee Conference mm -hmm. in a beautiful villa. All the representatives of all government ministries were there and they decided on the end losing the Judenfrage, the final solution of the, of the Jewish question. Let's repeat once more again. Why he didn't use them as slaves? Why he didn't use them in the factories? Because Why? they regarded them as, as, uh, as uh, equal to him, as enemies, not as slaves. He thought maybe they will start a revolution or something? Or? He, thought they, he thought that they are in contact with other Jews all over the world. There's a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. Like there is now an Aryan conspiracy to take over Europe. And the Aryans and Jews must decide once and for all who is in charge of the world. But that is the reason. Yes, and he believed that Roosevelt was a Jew. And whenever, whenever airplanes were bombing German cities, the German newspaper was saying the Jews bombed the cities again. Ah, uh, that's right. And he said the Jewish bankers invented the war. He said, without the Jewish bankers, the West would have accepted my... Why not to accept that I will conquer Russia? What's wrong with it? He didn't understand. He said, I, he explained why they... Because Stalin is a Bolshevik and the Bolsheviks are Jews. That's why they supported Stalin. He did not... He was shocked. Uh -huh. Hitler was shocked when they supported Stalin against him. Uh -huh. He was shocked. He said, it's not normal. Capitalism should fight Bolshevism. Why are they fighting me? I'm capitalist. He was, well, was he capitalist? Because some some people say that his national socialism works with yeah, some kind of... Listen, uh, the name of the Nazi party was National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. Five words that cover every possible ideology. Because he wanted everyone to vote for him. You are socialist, vote for me. You are nationalist, vote for me. You are German, vote for me. I mean, yes. So the name doesn't mean it. Mm -hmm. Hitler was not a socialist. He was something called in economy corporatist. That's the merger of major corporations with the state to act together. Hitler admired Mussolini, that was his father figure. And so Mussolini invented essentially fascism. Fascism was initially uh, economic this, uh, uh, ideology. Fascism believed that big industry together with the state should merge and create economy. And that was Hitler's approach. But Germany had enormous private sector and he did not touch it. He didn't, he didn't touch no. it? No. To the end of the war. No, no, nothing, no. To the end of the war, Germany had 81% of the economy in private hands. Completely private hands. Not Nazi hands, not party hands. Private hands. So Hitler was shocked. He said, I don't understand. This Stalin is a Bolshevist, communist, and so on. I'm capitalist. The capitalists are supporting him. Why? He said, oh, I understand why. Because Bolshevists and communists are Jews. Uh -huh. Of course they are supporting. One Jew is supporting another Jew. Against me. That but uh, actually they supported him because of the balance of power, power. So you said, yes. right? Nothing to do Jews. But in his mind, it was, everything was Jews. In his uh -huh. mind. Uh -huh. He was obsessed uh -huh. completely. Uh -huh. Sick to the core. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In this sense. You know. uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, only in 1941, when they, re when they acquired 6 million additional Jews and they realized there's no way to move them anywhere. Only then they said, okay, we need to kill them. I'm not justifying this crazy decision, of course. Crazy, sick, evil decision. Holocaust was evil event. Oh, not directly, not indirectly, I'm justifying this. But I'm also against falsifying history. You understand? Yes. To say the Nazis from the beginning wanted to kill the Jews and there was... A so let's ask you one question which maybe is really radical to ask, uh, especially to ask a Jew. But still, just for the sake of the, this interview, and uh, many, many times I have heard that maybe the Holocaust is not uh, happened. Maybe the Holocaust is uh, actually a bigger made-up story, it's not so big. What do you think about that? Is that true, everything about the Holocaust? No, Holocaust happened. And happened Are the numbers true? Numbers true. Are maybe... Underestimated. Some hypotheses mind. say that uh, all those Jews, or maybe mo mo most of them, went to the America, no, but no. they just... We uh, have right, the, right in here, like there, there. We have all the statistics. No, that's bullshit. That's Holocaust, bullshit. That's bullshit. Holocaust happened, and I think even underestimate. Underestimate. Underestimate because uh, after 19, after the end of 1943, before 1943, every Jew 
the cane had a tattoo stamped okay. and the tattoo was copied into a ledger, into a book. Mm -hmm. So it was written, you know, number 9437, mm -hmm. 8, is Luba Marshall Zone. Mm -hmm. They were okay. recording. Okay. But after 1943, the shipments became enormous. They established crematoria five and uh, four and five in Auschwitz, Treblinka, mm -hmm. and they began to burn to kill ten thousand Jews a day. Directly from the directly from the train. From the train, no, uh, no time for exactly no administration. Didn't bother. To, so uh, my estimate actually is more than six million were killed, in my view. Mm -hmm. And I studied this subject very deeply, and I am not the type to hesitate to say if it was less, I would not hesitate to tell you. Yes, I think this is falsificat of some kind, mm -hmm. because I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew second. I'm a truth seeker first. First, I'm addicted. I'm, mm -hmm. I owe allegiance to truth. Let's go now to Macedonia for a while. In that time, 41 to 45, uh, can you please tell us your view of what happened in Macedonia with the Macedonian Jews? Were the Macedonian society also anti-Semitic? Yes, like all peasant primitive societies, Macedonians were anti-Semitic, but not in. Was the Skopje anti-Semitic? The city? Yes, but not in a, not in the medieval way, not anti-Semitic to the of the kind you know. Let's kill the Jews. Not anti-Semitic in the scientific way. You know, the Jews are, are genetically inferior or genetically superior, and they are controlling all the world. Not this kind of anti-Semitism, but like I call it anti-Semitism of differences. That means the the Jews are different. Macedonia, as opposed to many other locations in Europe was not homogeneous country, it had many nationalities, many. So you were exposed to differences. You can't say this about someone from the war in Germany. He saw only Germans all his life. There were many people in Europe who, when they first saw black men, were shocked. They never, you know, you were not like that. You were exposed to Albanians and Tobishi and the Serbs and Bulgarians and million religions and comings and goings and Italians and Austrians and you know, you're in the crossroads. So the Jews were one more different. So we were more cosmo cosmopolitic than the Germans? And I wouldn't call it cosmopolitan because you were not that educated, you were not that, but you were more exposed to differences. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So for you to be different didn't mean to hate. Different. It's different. So it was kind of very mild anti-Semitism that did not lead, did not lead to any policies against the Jews, any attacks on the Jews, and there was nothing like that. So the Jews were happy here? There was no hatred. Mm -hmm. There was no hatred, no question about it. Okay. Of course, when the Bulgarians came and so on... Can you please uh, answer me uh, about Bulgarians? Were the Bulgarian society anti-Semitic mm. also? The, the, no. new, the new government which were co cooperate, cooperating with the Germans, were they anti-Semitic? No, not at all. But the Germans imposed on all their allies. Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria. Romanians were anti-Semitic in the bad sense, in the medieval sense of kill the Jews. Also the Kra Croatians? Croats, Croats. Um, no, uh, Hungarians. These people were anti-Semitic. And you had in these places organizations, anti-Semitic organizations that, that were committed to killing Jews. What about the Scandinavians? And, and also in Scandinavia, believe it or not, there were organizations committed to, among other things, killing Jews like in Norway, the Quisling organization. So. But in Bulgaria you didn't have that. You had the fascists, of course, but they were not, the killing Jews was not part of the, you didn't have that. And of course the king, the Tsar, was uh, Bulgarian, was uh, pro, pro-Jews, he was pro-Jewish and so on. There was no, the administration was not anti-Jewish and so on. The Germans put enormous pressure on Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, all the allies, Italy, on Italy, they put enormous pressure to, to concentrate the Jews and send them east to the camps. Everyone knew what was happening in the camps. Everyone knew. And the Bulgarians did not want to... Are you sure that they knew? Yeah, yeah, somebody everyone. somebody said we, we didn't know. Even, even in Germany, some everyone. people, some people say, we, uh, you, know, you know that uh, in Nuremberg, the, the, the general said we didn't know that they were killing Jews? Every single person knew. Everyone. How did they knew? There was in the, in first the, of in all, the journals. First of all, there was the, no television then. First of all, the soldiers who were in the front were sending letters home, telling everyone what was happening. There was no military censorship at the time, so believe it or not. So they were sending letters. Oh, the military censorship did not censor this. We have numerous thousands of letters from soldiers in Yad Vashem, uh, German soldiers. You know, uh, today we rounded up uh, twenty thousand Jews. We killed them in a period. Uh -huh. uh, so. 
so from mouth to mouth there was yeah the they were taking photos and sending home taking photos taking photos behind them With bodies what? burning there were photo photo parts there, there? yes they were, the soldiers were taking photos with a pile of bodies behind them. And we have many uh -huh. sources. This is one source. Mm -hmm. Secondly, people saw that neighbors are disappearing, never coming back, and so on. So, mm -hmm. And the joke, in the saying in Germany was, uh, you know, uh, I will send you up the chimney. They, uh -huh. even, knew, they yeah. even knew that. Even the jokes were. Uh, yeah, the jokes were. Uh -huh. Everyone knew. Okay. Everyone knew. Okay. Although officially it was called Endlösung, en mm -hmm. final solution, or resettlement. Mm -hmm. or everyone knew what it meant. Okay. Of course the Bulgarians knew. They wanted to protect Jews, but they could not protect all the Jews at all times. They could protect only their Jews. I, I understand that maybe Hitler also paid for them to, to send them the Jews. Uh, <coughs> there was not a question of payment, but there was a question, there was a, a settlement of uh, expenses. It was called expenses, ah, mainly for ah, railway. Ah, that's railway mm -hmm. The Germans were paying, if I remember correctly, five Reichsmarks for each Jew on a train, which was kind of subsidy, kind of a reward, mm -hmm. and so on. The guy in charge of the trains was Adolf Eichmann, who was later captured by the Mossad and executed in Israel. With, 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 with the trial? With the trial in 1961. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so the Bulgarians had to choose. If they did not agree any Jew to be killed, the Germans would have taken over. They have done that. They will take over the country? Yes, they have done that. They have done it in Italy. In with Badoglio, Marshal Badoglio, and they, they took over Italy. They, the German, the killing the Jews was the priority of the Reich. Second was the war. When the Germans were losing the war, they were still killing it. They were diverting trains to transport Jews to kill them. Trains that were needed in the front, oh. with weapons, with uh -huh. clothing. Uh -huh. German soldiers were dying of cold in Russia because, because the, the trains, trains were full with Jews. Full of Jews. Oh my God. That was priority. And if you did not want to kill the Jews, the Germans would have taken over your country. As they did in Hungary. In Hungary there was a guy called Marshal Hothi. He was a military man. He was Admiral actually. Admiral Hothi. And he refused to kill the Jews. Germans were putting pressure. Eichmann came a million times, you know, killed the Jews, killed the... How many years he was refusing? One four year? years he was. Oh. Four years he refused to kill the Jews. Four years he was refusing? Refusing. Four years. Okay. Finally he said, okay, you can kill the Jews that came from Romania into Hungary, but not Hungarian Jews. All these countries made the same deal. You can kill other Jews, but not my Jews. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So, he said, okay, you can kill the Romanian Jews that came into Hungary like refugees, but you cannot kill my Jews, uh -huh, and so on. Uh -huh. They wait. The Germans I'm surprised that they, hit, they had power to say no to Hitler then. Listen, they were independent countries and Hitler was busy in Russia. Uh -huh. and they, to some extent. Mm -hmm. They said no on this, but they said yes on this. Mm -hmm. Hitler, the, for instance, Hoti told the Hitler, I will not kill the Jews, but I'm sending you another division uh -huh. of Hungarian soldiers, uh -huh. etc. They were playing games, they were buying time. Mm -hmm. Everyone was hoping, after 43, everyone knew that but Hitler I, but would... I thought uh, Hungary was uh, anti-Semitic. Why, 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 why was he doing it that? It was another type of anti-Semitism. Uh -huh. It was anti-Semitism to kill so the Jews. Yes, not to kill the Jews. I mean, you can be anti-Semitic, but uh -huh. you know what? I don't like Jews. <laughs> I'm a Jew, I don't like Jews, mm -hmm. but I would never consider to kill Jews. Mm -hmm. It's completely crazy. Yes. When we were off the interview, I mean, you told me you you sound like you hate the... Uh, it's the fact that you disagree with someone or dislike someone doesn't give you the right to kill them. Yes. It's it's crazy thought, you know. So what was the... the so anyway, I'm telling you about Hoti. So Hoti uh -huh. refused four years. Mm -hmm. In 1944, the Germans invaded and threw, uh, killed they, his son. They invaded Hungary? They invaded Hungary, killed his son and threw him out of power and put their own men. And kill the Jews? And kill the Jews. They had time? A little time, but in this little time they diverted all the trains, all the crematoria in Auschwitz. And Auschwitz was closing down, the Germans were retreating. Mm -hmm. The Soviets were bombing three, five kilometers away and there were trains coming with Hungarian Jews. They killed six, seven hundred thousand Hungarian Jews. For one week or something? For weeks. Not one week, but weeks. For a month. Yeah. They killed, wow. they killed 400,000 Hungarian Jews from mm -hmm. Budapest mainly mm -hmm. and 300,000 Romanian that escaped to Hungary but it Jeez. was the last second. Mm -hmm. uh, German soldiers were, f were, were undersupplied, undernourished, no food, no and Just and for everything this was going uh, to kill them. Primary, primary goal. What I'm trying to tell you, the Bulgarians could have said no and no and no up to a point. They had to give something. Mm -hmm. So they said okay, don't touch our Jews, take these Jews. 
from Macedonia in other territories. So take them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there was the deal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so that was that's what happened. Now, of course, the Bulgarians were the the Bulgarians who were sent to administer Macedonia mm -hmm. were not only anti-Semitic; they were also anti-Macedonian. They thought they thought that Macedonians were inferior people. The Macedonians were garbage. The Bulgarians that came here to administer Macedonia mm -hmm. were essentially anti-Macedonian as well, not only anti-Jewish. Anti they were anti-everything. Yeah, I think I think that the official uh, official history and policies that we are their brothers uh, equal to them. Yes, but they thought you were inferior, and they treated you as inferior. And, you and sure, you sure about yeah, that? Yeah, sure, completely. And you say it in the movie also. It's not, uh, yeah. okay. What about the uh, what about the Macedonian uh, um, part of the story? Shouldn't we actually? Uh, protest about that, uh, Macedonians from Macedonia, when that happened? Macedonians, when the Jews were rounded up and sent to the tobacco factory and so on, in Skopje, mm -hmm. in Ohrid also, they were rounded Bitola up, in Bitola and so on. Bitola mainly, mm -hmm. actually. When the Jews were rounded up and all of them were sent. Stip also. Yeah. The, most of the Macedonians stood aside and did not protest and did not do anything. That, I think, is because of Macedonian character. Macedonians that, uh, huh? No, not only envy, but uh, t um, therapy, um, submissive. You don't protest against authority. Whatever the authority does, we do. And also, they were opportunistic. We have many, d we have documented cases that Macedonians invaded the apartments after the Jews left and took everything. There is a historian, her name is Jenny Labelle, who spent a lot of time, her main work is about Holocaust in Macedonia. And she documented what the Macedonians, how they reacted. So they did not protest. Some of them were very happy and cheered up, cheered the uh, deportation, mm -hmm. and m almost all of them entered immediately the apartment, stole everything, and so on. Also, the the but business, the business uh, businesses places, were sold uh, for zero, Dukians, yeah. and partners who were partners for decades, the other partner took off. But I want to say something. This is not unique to Macedonia. Everyone behaved like this. The Polish, the the. All Europeans, when the Jews were deported, took over the property, stole the property, took the businesses. It's not a Macedonian thing, you know. And where was resistance to Germans? Nowhere. No population resisted the Germans. There was resistance in France. How many were in the resistance? A few hundred. Yeah? The population did not. Population. So Macedonians were not exceptional. They did not behave exceptionally badly. They did not help. They robbed the Jews. Everyone did. Everyone did. The movie is a bit normally. <laughs> you are talking about third half. Yes, the movie is a bit normally is a bit biased in favor of Macedonians because there were formations in Macedonia, groups who collaborated actively with the Bulgarians and also collaborated with the Bulgarians against the Jews. Active formations, groups, organized groups, and so on. They had their own insignia, their own uniform. Macedonians. You don't see any trace of these people in the movie, except this guy who is collaborating with the Bulgarian and finally shoots himself in the head at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. He is representative. But we are not talking one or two people in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. There were not small elements in the population who collaborated with the Bulgarian occupier, also against the Jews. But again, it's not exceptional. Everywhere in Europe, there were groups who collaborated with the German occupiers. It's not unique to Macedonia, there's no shame in it. What about the museum for the Holocaust uh, in Skopje? The, the Macedonians believe that the Jews control the world. <laughs> and they definitely believe that the Jews control the United States. <laughs> That's why they made the, the yes, museum? Yes, that's the only reason. They are, they are, there is no justification for a museum in a country where 7,000 people were killed. Museum of this size. It's an attempt by Macedonians to bribe the Jews to help them with the United States, with economy, with investments. Okay. The, but uh, the true is that uh, Macedonian politicians were always uh, close uh, with the Israeli politicians, uh, historically. Uh, oh. I heard that uh, in the history, one Macedonian uh, member of Turkish parliament talked uh, positively about Israel. Yeah, there was a speech. Uh, and they there was no Israel then. They talked mm -hmm. positively about giving rights to the Jews in Palestine. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes but, you know, it's, uh, there was no historical alliance between the nations mm -hmm. and so on. Where the Macedonians felt as a nation, many dispute. I think they did. 
because I saw documents of the British Foreign Office and so on, that were Macedonians, identified themselves as Macedonians. So I think there was a concept of collective. But I don't know if there was a concept of nation, you know, like we are a nation, we must have our own country. I think this came later. Mm -hmm. There were Macedonians. Many of them regarded themselves as Bulgarians. Many of them regarded themselves as Macedonians. Many of them regarded themselves as Ottoman, Turk, Turks, and so on. So, and, but there was no alliance you know, between the two nations. No. Continue about uh, Israel now, these days. Uh, is it short to say, is it too much if I say that now Israel is doing to the Palestinians what the uh, Germans were doing to the, Isra to the Jews in the yeah, Second World War? Yeah, that's way too exaggerated. The Germans concentrated the Jews, and after 41 they exterminated the Jews uh, in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. Israelis are not exterminating the Palestinians. However, it would be true to say that the Jews, the Israelis, uh, behavior in the occupied territories is the same like the German behavior in their occupied territories, to some extent. Because the German had, uh, for instance, collective punishment, mass punishments, that the Jews don't have. Um, still, it's a, it's a policy of occupation, policy of apartheid, policy... And whenever you start to occupy another people in their own homes, you are going down and down morally and ethically until you have no leg to stand on, until you become immoral. Can we talk about the history of uh, Israel? What happened there? There were a lot of wars there. Who started the wars? Why were why was those, those wars? Technically, the Arabs attacked the Jews in the in the last years of the 19th century and well into the 1930s, several times in several waves. The Arabs felt that the Jews were were invading their country. It which, is true. Which was the truth? Uh, well, it is true that the Jews bought the land. The Jews paid the Arabs. They, they, it's not true that the Jews took land by force. They didn't have a force. They came there. They had special financial organizations that bought the land. So all the land that Israel was established on as a state was bought with money. Um, but of course, never, regardless of whether you paid for it or you did not pay for it, gradually there were more and more settlements, Jewish settlements. More kibbutzim, more moshavi, more cities, more... And the Jews made it a point to establish Jewish outposts, neighborhoods, exactly next to Arab neighborhoods in order to block Arab advance. So Tel Aviv was established on the doorstep of Jaffa, Jaffa. Ah. Jaffa was Arab country, uh, Arab uh, city. Uh -huh. Tel Aviv was established exactly on the doorstep. Uh -huh. Modern Haifa was established exactly on the doorstep of Arab Haifa. Uh -huh. It was a Jewish policy to block the advance of Arabs uh -huh. and uh, their possibility of their spreading into the hinterland of, of uh, Palestine. As the, as the Jewish settlement spread, it was clear that the Jews were trying to create territorial continuity and con contiguity with the aim of dividing Palestine to two states. How they, they, did they put also, did they buy also parts of Jerusalem? Yes, big, big lots in Jerusalem were purchased by the Jews before the, the 1948 war. That is a fact that is little known. People think that they took over the, but actually they bought everything. Um, but they, they had a plan. They wanted to establish strips of population and so on to isolate Arabs from each other and to establish two states. One Palestinian state and one uh, Jewish state. And in 1937 there was a committee called the Pils Committee, a British committee. The, Britain, the British at that time were the, in charge of Palestine. They had the mandate from the United Nations for Palestine. And so the Pils Committee recommended to create two states, Jewish and Palestinian. Palestinian rejected it. We had a foreign minister, uh, a Jew from South Africa. His name was Abba Ibn. And Abba Ibn said, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And he's right. They rejected it in 1937. They rejected a similar, a similar solution in 1948, when the United Na 47, when the United Nations said there should be two states and gave very little area to the Jews and a big area to the Arabs, the Arabs rejected it. They, they wanted everything. 
they, well, they believed that they could get everything because the Arab states around mobilized their armies and were planning they to... They wanted to kill them? They no. wanted to extract... To well, there were the slogans, you know, throw the Jews to the sea, uh -huh. we will swim in Jewish blood, uh, the usual slogans of... But they were expecting they to, to, yeah, to go away and go somewhere there was else? No, no, there was no intention to kill or exterminate, no, no, not to go away. They believed that the Jews could remain as citizens in the Arab state. Ah, that, that was the, the, yeah. the main... Yeah, they the main not, were not to go away. So they wanted to conquer the land? Yeah. And the, the Jews, Jews to live as part of that country? At the beginning. After and, uh, our, what was their goal uh, to, toward the Jews? Uh, did they uh, would have to try to kill them or do something to them or no? Just to leave them to live well, of as course, a normal, in war, normal, normal in citizen? War, or? In war there were riots and so people got killed. There were massacres in Hebron, other places and so on. It was clear that if war should erupt, the civilian centers, populations would be affected. Mm -hmm. The Jews also killed civilian populations in Kafr Qasim and other places. There was a Jewish ethnic cleansing policy in Lydia, in Lod, in other places where the Jews entered and cleansed the whole population. Libya? Lydia, Lod. What is that? Is it it's a, a city. city in Israel? Israel. On the coast, Lod. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So both parties, both sides wanted to ethnically cleanse. But only in the 1960s the Palestinians adopted a policy. The Jews who came to Palestine after 1917 should be repatriated to the countries, should not stay in Palestine. Oh. But only in the 1960s, the PLO uh -huh. was Fatah, Fatah policy. Uh -huh. At that stage in 1948, the Arab belief was that the Arab armies of the states around will destroy the, the Jewish army and they will take over the place and who is there, who is there, I mean, uh -huh. no problem. Uh -huh. Of course they failed. And uh, the end result was effectively a Jew, one Jewish state, the state of Israel, and a state that was 60% Palestinian, Jordan. Transjordan, as it was called then, was 60% Palestinian, 40% Bedouin. And to this very day, it's 50% Palestinian, 50% Bedouin. The Likud, which is the right wing of, of Israel, says, Palestinians have a state. They have a state in Jordan. They have almost a state in Lebanon. But they definitely have a state in Jordan. Why do they need another state? That's the official uh, line of the extreme... The Jordan is neighbor to Israel, right? Yes, adjacent, adjacent to Israel. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the line of the ultra-nationalists in Israel. The Palestinians have a state, they don't need another state. But this, was, this is history. Today... In well, what, the, what the Palestinians from Israel want? Do they believe that Jordan is the Palestinian state? First of all, there are Arabs who are Israeli citizens. So they are Arab Israelis, they are not Palestinians. They are Arabs who are Israelis. They have Israeli passport, exactly like me. But they are Arabs. Mm -hmm. They don't have the same rights because they are not allowed to serve in the army. Okay. But they can and are elected to parliament. Arab is Arabic is the second official language of Israel. I speak Arabic. The vast majority of Israelis speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. The second official language. Mm -hmm like let's say Albanian would be here mm -hmm. and, and so uh, there is a big segment of Arab population uh, Arabs who live in Israel and they are Israelis these Arabs begin began to hate Israel the Arab Israelis began to hate Israel in the 1980s after the first intifada 1987 are we talking about the, the Palestinians who live in uh, no, occupied they territories not, they are not Palestinians or we talk about Arab Israelis who, who live in Israel inside Israel yes. we're not talking about Gaza no, or no. West Bank no no we're talking okay. about Arabs okay. who live inside Israel. There's more than a million of them. Why you say they're not Palestinians? What they say for themselves? Are they Palestinians? They used to say that they are Arab Israelis. But now they say they are Palestinians. After the Intifada, uh -huh. they more and more... What is the difference for you? Palestinians are people who are not Israeli citizens. Uh -huh. They're Arabs, but they're not Israeli citizens. Okay. Okay? Like Arab who, Arab who lives in America or Canada. Well, is it, I thought Palestinian is an ethnic uh, term. No, Palestinian is a national. Like Macedonia. Nationality. It's a nationality, not ethnic term. It's a person who lives in Palestine. You could be Macedonian with Palestinian passport. It's, uh, but most minute. Palestinians are Arabs. Let, let me then ask you, uh, which are et ethnicities who live in uh, that, 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 that Arabs region? and Jews. Arab, Arabs and Jews? Yes. Some Arabs are Syrians, some Arabs are Palestinians, some Arabs are Israeli, some Arabs are Lebanese. And what is the religion of those Arabs? They are mixed. Some of them Muslims, some of them Christians. So some are Christians? Of course. There are huge Christian minorities in Lebanon. In Syria there's a Christian minority. In, what, what, the Christians on which side? On the Orthodox side? mostly. 
No, 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 which side in the conflict? The Arabs. So basically they are against uh, Jews? Of course. They are Christian in religion, Arabs in nationality. Uh -huh. It's like American Catholic. Uh -huh. He's American, he fights for America, he's Catholic. Okay? Okay, okay. So the Palestinians are people who have Palestinian citizenship, in effect. Most of them, vast majority, are Arabs. So. How can you have a uh, citizenship when that is not a country? Now you can have, because there is a Palestinian authority. Uh -huh. It issues certificate. So, pal so Palestina, what is called Palestina, is actually two pieces of land. One is... Uh, the Palestinian Authority. West Coast and Gaza, right? Yes, there is the, there is the, the, the West uh, Bank. West Bank? West Bank and Gaza. Mm -hmm. This is what we call today the, the Palestinian Authority. Okay. Palestine, before 1948, was everything. Everything. Today's state of Israel and the West Bank and Gaza, mm -hmm. that was Palestine. Mm -hmm. Then Israel became, and what was left became Jordan. Are you agreeing with me that uh, the Jewish uh, lobby in the world is very powerful and they are using the media to, to, to picture different picture for that conflict? That, uh, in the world, no. But in America, yes. In the world, they're not. In America, they are powerful, yes. So many people think that actually the Jews are victims and not many, part many of the Americans, problem. Many Americans think. You will not find many British who think the Jews are. <laughs> Depends where. Mm -hmm. The Danish and the Scandinavians, I mean, what the is Swedish. It who is the victim? Who is the problem? Are they both part of the problem? Are the both uh, parts of the Palestinian problem uh, very rigid? Uh, you have two nations, two groups, collectives. I don't know if they're nations. Uh, they decided that they're nations, so they're nations. Mm -hmm. You have two nations who are competing for the same territory. Identical territory. Now, what will decide who will control the territory is force, might, power. There is no question here who is victim, who is not, who is right, who is wrong. The Jews want this territory, the Palestinians want this territory. The Palestinians used Arab states to attack Israel, the Israelis used their army to attack the Palestinians. Everyone is In attacking America everyone. Also. everyone is Israel is using America. Also. Yes, it's a little like Yugoslavia, you know. The Croats killed the Serbs, the Serbs killed the Croats. Who is a, who is a war criminal in, in Serbia? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody was. I was advisor to the Serbs in the early 90s. I'm telling you, everyone killed everyone. Albanians were war criminals, Serbs were war criminals, Croats were... They were all war criminals. The, the, Albanians and the Croats succeeded to manipulate world media and especially American media against the Serbs. There's something else. But in reality, they were all killing each other, all massacring and slaughtering each other. Same in Palestine, same in Israel. Everyone is killing everyone. The question is, like in boxing, who will remain standing? <laughs> who will remain standing? Who will have the knockout and who will remain standing? Now, is it just to, to, for two boxers to fight? It is what we call, it, it is a situation that cannot be resolved by, by, uh, by uh, applying ethics or applying morality or applying abstract thinking or applying reasoning. And because there's one table and we both want it. Okay, so in the year 2000, Barak, who was then Prime Minister, you're talking about Ehud Barak, right? Ehud Barak, who was then Prime Minister. Israeli Prime Minister. Yes. Offered uh -huh. to the Palestinians, made an offer to the Palestinians, giving them 97% of the West Bank, 100% of Gaza, and one-third of Jerusalem. And he agreed that for the 3% of West Bank that he's not giving them, they will take 3% of Israel. But to that extent. Can you repeat this again, please? Please, sorry. Yes. In the in the in the latest offer that Israel made to the Palestinians through when Ehud Barak was Prime Minister, mm -hmm. and after that Netanyahu in the Y agreement and so on reaffirmed it, mm -hmm. they were offered ninety seven percent of the West Bank. Okay. All of Gaza. Okay. And about one third of Jerusalem. Or co co govern government of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Like uh, to declare it extraterritorial city capital of both countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Palestinians rejected it. You know what the problem is in the Middle East? Not who is right and who is wrong, but who benefits. The Romans said, the Romans had the saying, never ask who is right or wrong, ask qui bono, who benefits. Who benefits? Everyone benefits from war. 
there are huge interests to continue the war. Israeli military industry, Israeli high-tech industry, the army, if you put the army into the equation, so employ well over 40% of the manpower in Israel. Wow. If you add to that, if you add to that indirect suppliers and so on, mm -hmm. the main product of Israel is war. War. Everything that was invented in Israel, including the high-tech industry, was invented by the military or for the military. It's a little like the United States, where most of the major inventions are by the Pentagon, including the Internet. The Internet was invented by DARPA, an agency of the Pentagon. For so. Israel is heavily invested in war, exactly like America. The United States is also heavily invested in war. And the Palestinians are invested in war. Where would people like Arafat be if the war stops? Immediately, and indeed when the war stopped, immediately there were accusations of corruption and you know these people use war and tension with the neighbors to survive politically to make fortunes and who is collateral damage the people uh, and also the world because the terrorism al-qaeda is the answer to palestinian everyone problem. in the in palestine and israel benefits from the war in but my except, family except the, except the every the, the kill people no the I, I am a journalist and an author. I'm very careful with my words. Every single person in Israel benefits from the war. Every single person in Palestine benefits from the war. Look at my family. In my family, I have two. My sister and my brother work in the military, in the army. You know, they benefit from the war. If there is no war, their, their jobs will be cut out. They will be unemployed. What about killed people? What about uh, injured people? So, of course, to have a war, you must have some kind of war. It reminds me of 1984, the famous novel by George Orwell. In 1984, people, at the end of the day, after they finish work, they are, they are taken into an auditorium, and they sit, and there is what is called a hate, hate session. They show a bit on a big screen, Trans-Asia attack, attack Trans-America. The next day, Trans-Asia and Trans-America are attacking Trans-Europe. Your yesterday's enemy became your today's ally against the third party. The next day, Trans-Europe and Trans-America, it's exactly in Israel. Exactly. Now, Mahmoud Abbas in the West Bank relies on Israel to survive because the Hamas, uh, uh, not until now. Now, he's friends with the Hamas against Israel. Hamas actually and Hezbollah were invented by Israel. Why? In, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon. Why? Why? Yeah. To confront the to confront other groups that when Israel was fighting in Lebanon. It's this, this is this, this was a surprise for me. I didn't know that Israel yeah. invented Hezbollah. Hamas and uh, Hamas and uh, Hezbollah are groups which are affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and later with the Iranian regime. But originally, Israel, when it invaded Lebanon, needed Muslim militia in the Shia mountains to fight against the Palestinians. I thought Palestinians are Muslims also. Yes, but you don't understand the Middle East. Everyone is everyone's ally and everyone is working with everyone depends on the circumstances. There are no loyalties. Are you sure that Israel invented Hezbollah? Israel was heavily involved in the in the establishment of all these groups. Israel was heavily involved. You could not have established those groups. You, you mentioned uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Can you shortly uh, cover the uh, Arab uh, Spring? Arab Spring is an invention of Western media. Never happened. Never happened? Never. Arab Spring is a name given to three distinct movements in the Arab world. One movement of economic character, where mostly young, unemployed, educated people protested against governments and forced these governments either to fall or to implement new policies of employment in their countries. Which 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 part of the Well that's for instance Morocco. Morocco? Morocco. Okay. And and Tunisia. Okay. These were young people. Their protest was not political at all, it was economic. Uh -huh. They could not find jobs. They were unemployed. They were working in inferior jobs or not at all. For you though that was not a voice for democracy? No, no, no. What democracy? They wanted jobs. Okay. What democracy? Same Egypt. What democracy? You have democracy in Egypt. Plus jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one group, one movement. 
simultaneously and not connected to it, there was there is a political movement. Where? Syria, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, Libya. Mm -hmm. These were political movements. They were mostly influenced by Islam, not necessarily radical Islam, but Islam. And they were against tyrants, against dictators, not because they were dictators, but because they stopped sharing sharing the spoils equally. Mm -hmm. So these movements are interested in spreading the wealth more equally. They're also economic in nature, but they have a strong political overtone that would be Libya and Syria. And the third movement is a movement in uh, where moderate Islam is trying to take over as an alternative to the theocracy in Iran and so on, and trying to coexist with minorities such as the Christians. All three are revolutionary or evolutionary in nature, but they have nothing to do with each other. The revolution in Tunisia has nothing, zero, to do with, uh, with Syria. And the revolution in Syria has nothing to do with Egypt. Nothing. In Syria there is civil war. Now there will be a civil war in Egypt. But it has nothing to do with Syria. You, you are predicting a war in Egypt? Yes, it's already happening. I'm <laughs> predicting it. Stop it. Can you explain to to uh, to us? Uh, you remember that I told this guy in Vienna. We met an Egyptian in Vienna. I told him uh, it was a few months ago. I told him there will be a civil war in Egypt. No way. We are peaceful people. I said there will be a civil war in Egypt. You're Who is going to be between which groups? The ultimately the military and the people. But before that, there will be a stage of the people against the Muslims, against the Muslim Brotherhood. But this stage will be very soon over because the military will support the Muslim Brotherhood against the people. Ultimately, aren't, the result aren't, aren't the people Muslims also? So why will they no, fight no, against no. the Muslims? What, what's, uh, Muslim Brotherhood is a political movement. What do you mean? Aren't you Macedonian and Guest Macedonian? Muslim Brotherhood is a political movement. Of course. Mm -hmm. with, what, with what kind of agenda? Muslim establishing Islam in uh, in Egypt, moderate Islam in Egypt. So why would that be the problem with the, the people? People are also Muslims so anyway, so... Why do you have a problem with Gorski? You're both Macedonians. Because they don't disagree on, on whether Islam should be implemented as a law of the land. To what extent? What liberty should be limited? What not? Whether uh, women can work or not, can drive or not, etc. etc. There are disagreements between many two people. You have three opinions. But Muslim Brotherhood is political. The military will use the Muslim Brotherhood to suppress the people. What about Al-Qaeda and Muslim Brotherhood? Are they connected? Very indirectly. Very indirectly because Muslim Brotherhood was suppressed for decades in Egypt and had to make contacts with... Can we slowly cover the Libya civil war and then I want to ask about Al-Qaeda something. So, can you please uh, tell us what, what with, with your opinion about... Uh, in both Libya and Syria, you have a situation Excuse of me, I, I, I thought Syria. Excuse me, I want okay. to talk same. about Syria. It's the same Syria. situation. Mm -hmm. Because in, in the Syria now is very bloody and I'm, I'm really surprised that the same nation is fighting so hard in Egypt. It's not a nation. Syria was invented by the French. There was no... Syria, Syria and Lebanon together were a territorial unit in which Arabs lived. But yeah. the nation of Syria <laughs> was a colonial invention, like all the nations of Africa, which never existed. Who is fighting against who in Syria now? In Syria and in, in Libya. It's the same situation. Mm -hmm. A dictator who came from a minority tribe okay. took over the state, okay. depriving mm -hmm. the majority tribes. Okay. That's exactly what happened with, with uh, Gaddafi. That's exactly what's happening with... Uh, in Syria, the Assad family, Assad mm -hmm. family are coming from a minority called the Alawis. Okay. The Alawis are a sect in Islam who are considered to be heretics okay. by vast majority of Muslims. Mm -hmm. The Alawis in Syria are 9.7% of the population and they control 90% of the state. The other tribes, mainly the Shias, but not only the Shias, the Sunnis, are not happy about it. Okay. In Libya, Muammar Gaddafi came from a highly specific area in Libya where there was a single tribe, small. He took over the state. The other tribes collaborated until he stopped dividing their money from the oil. And he became rich. And his people became rich. And then they 
So in Syria and Libya, you have a tribal war, similar to Africa, mm -hmm. similar to Rwanda. Yes, Rwanda, yes. yes. Tutsi and Hutu. Yes. yes, it's exactly like Rwanda. It's nothing to do with Arab Spring and Arab bullshit. What this is, is the Western interest in these wars? West has no interest in these wars. There. That's why, not, in, that's why it's not West, doing anything. West the, don't have interest in Arab in Spring? Syria? In Arab Spring? There is no Arab Spring. Okay, in those activities there. But there are no activities. People say Each that country is separate. People say that the West was angry at Gaddafi because he didn't want to give them uh, so each country, you have to oil. look each country separately. Okay, let's talk about Libya. You see that in Syria, the West is not inter intervening. The West has no interest in Syria. Uh, West is not helping the rebels? No. With the uh, with, uh, arms? Hillary Clinton said that they will, but the war has been going on for more than a year. Where are the weapons? The West has no interest in Syria, except if the war spills over to Turkey and Israel. Then the West but will Obama have said that. Uh, we need a start to go. They've been saying it for, for years. Don't forget that in, in Libya, the West bombed Gaddafi. Why they're not bombing Assad? Because Russia is going to be angry. Russia did not agree to Libya also. Check if you don't believe me. Russia was against Libya also. But uh, Russia is very involved in Syria. They Syria is nothing. They, they There's they nothing send, in Syria. They send it, uh, there is there, nothing in Syria. Some ships and yeah. even Assad is living on a Russian ship. Russia is zero compared to the United States. It doesn't frighten anyone. Russia, now we, again, Russian interests Putin. are irrelevant completely. If the West wanted to interfere, they would interfere. And you know what? If the war spills to Israel and to Turkey, you will see the next day NATO planes bombing Assad. Period. Russia is irrelevant. And what Russia says is irrelevant. Russia likes to make muscles because they, it used to be. Russia is dead. The West decides each case according to the... Why, Russia, why West, uh, Western countries don't want us to go? No. There is nothing in Syria. Ah. It's an empty country. There's nothing there. They don't, they don't want to, to... There's no to economy. There's little oil. They don't want to spoil uh, army. Yeah. There is nothing there. Armament. In, in Libya you have oil. In Iraq you have oil. In Israel, you have Israel, military, that you can use. Mm -hmm. What do you have in Syria? All old, old, uh, bazaars and uh, sand. It's a zero country, it's nothing there. Absolutely nothing. What about Al-Qaeda? You know uh, what is Syria's only value? No. That it can spoil Turkey and spoil Israel. That it can threaten Turkey and threaten Israel. It's the only value of Syria. If Syria was in the Pacific Isle, uh, Ocean, they can kill each other. To the for, end of days. For centuries. Yes. It's just because they are close to Israel and Turkey that anyone is paying attention. Otherwise, it's a zero country. Libya has 5% of the uh, oil reserves in the world. Iraq, more. Of course, they would intervene there. Russians or not Russians? Russians were What told. about terrorism and Al Qaeda and all those things? Was there Al Qaeda uh, answer to the to the Palestinian problem? No, no. Al Qaeda has nothing to do with Palestinian problem. This like a solidarity no, no, no. of the Muslims, radical no, no. Muslims, to, these are very to hit America, these to, are to very punish naive. for their uh, support of Israel? Sasha, these are naive terms. The vast majority of people never play in politics, never work in politics, and so they need a way to explain to them what's happening. So that you say Al-Qaeda supported the Palestinians. This is, this is for children. It's, these questions are not... How do you explain Al-Qaeda? These questions are not worthy of someone sophisticated like you. Mm -hmm. Organizations and countries don't act because they have sympathies. It's not high school when you have sympathy for someone. They act because of interest. Al-Qaeda's main activity is drug smuggling. It's the main activity of Al-Qaeda. It's a drug cartel, similar to cartels in South America. And the same goes for most other international terrorist organizations. Now you see in, in Algeria, terrorist organizations attacking and so on, they are also drug organizations. They smuggle drugs, they have monopoly on tobacco in throughout North Africa, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they smuggle drinks and so on. These are economic interests, economic cartels. Al-Qaeda is collaborating worldwide with all the other terrorist organizations in exporting and disseminating mainly drugs. It's the main activity of Al-Qaeda. Of course, they have to justify themselves ideologically because they are under cover of ideology. And they justify themselves ideologically, so from time to time they bomb something. You know. As long as the drug interests are not threatened, 
There was no Al Qaeda and there was no activity against anyone. Is it a coincidence that activities against the United States started after it invaded the opium fields in uh, the poppy fields in Afghanistan? Not a minute before. When, when America when, began, when that happened, when America began to threaten the the drug activities, when that happened, Russia invaded Afghanistan in 1979. It disrupted the the drug trade. Okay. And America invaded Afghanistan after 2000, after 9/11. Yes. yes. But, uh, but America. Uh, okay, that happened no, before that. No. They attacked the no. the military ship. You remember? They yes. Attacked yes. The, uh, yes. Embassies in Africa. Yes, because when the Russians left in 1982, the West entered Afghanistan with a prime minister called Bakhtiar. Okay. They, 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 Afghanistan moved from Russia to the West. But they were under the Taliban. Taliban were with nobody. Yes, but they were no longer. They were anti-Russians. Taliban and all these mujahideen were were, were inventions of CIA. Okay. You understand? Yes. Don't you ask yourself why suddenly the Mujahideen, who used to be controlled by the CIA, financed by the CIA, armed by the CIA, why they suddenly change and, and begin because to attack? Because it's a Palestinian question. What Palestinian? What question? Who cares about the Palestinians? They were threatened because the West began to interfere in the drug trade. That was the main issue. They are drug traders, drug dealers. That's the main activity of Al-Qaeda. You don't have to trust me, you can go online and read. That's the main activity of these people. You threaten the drug trade, they will act against you. You don't threaten, they leave you alone. So, it is true that the Taliban took over. You're right about that. But the West got rid of Russia, using Mujahideen and so on to get rid of Russia. Okay. After they left, yes. the regimes in Afghanistan were essentially controlled by the CIA, by the West. When the CIA and other American agencies began to act against the drug trade, there was a split, a break, between the West and the Afghan regime, mm -hmm. and after that, between the West and all the Muslim military, I mean, Mujahideen, and mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. it is directly connected to the activities against the drug trade. It is a fact that before 1983, 4, there were no activities against the drug trade. Actually, the CIA was smuggling drugs together with everyone. It's very naive the way the Western media describe it. It's intelligence agencies, drug smugglers, so-called terrorists, exactly like what I told you before. They are playing musical chairs. One day the CIA is working with Osama bin Laden. One day against him. One day Osama is, uh, bin Laden is smuggling drugs for the CIA. Helping the CIA to smuggle drugs from South America. One day against. One day the Iranian regime is helping the CIA to sell uh, drugs so that the CIA can finance um, or rebels in El Salvador, El Salvador. And the next day they're enemies. There are no enemies. If Al Qaeda is a narco cartel, yes. why would they attack? Uh uh, America on 9-11 and, uh, because America, and killed themselves in the head. Why would they do that? Because America acted for years against drug trafficking emanating from Central Asia. I thought uh, Al Qaeda want to punish Americans for their, their, their uh, support for Israel. And they are killing some Palestinians and things like that. Listen, if you insist to be naive, you can be naive. Okay. But that, that was the official story these of are the Al Qaeda. These are stories for idiots propagated through the Western media. Everyone is collaborating or not collaborating with everyone. It's a, a group of criminals. Al-Qaeda is a criminal, CIA is criminals, Mossad is criminals. We are all criminals. They, all of them are criminals. One day your enemy is my friend, one day you are my friend against the enemy. One is, is the terrorism justified if you could not kill the, the soldier in that uh, fighter jet uh, many, many miles in the air or do not kill the the controller of the best pilot in Lethal, or how they say that uh, in drones, drones on the drones. Is it justified that you can actually put your uh, explosive on yourself and just blow up in front in front of the embassy because you want to 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 react on the, the all the killings that America is doing? So in that term, 
we had in our history was Macedonian terrorism, if you know those uh, Gemiji or Vamaro. We had in our history it's that kind of answer to the Turks. So is it terrorism justified in that point it of view? It is always justified to kill diplomats. It's always justified to kill soldiers. Definitely. Always. There's no exception. It is never justified to kill civilians. But is it all killing civilians also? It's never justified to kill civilians. I just said. It is a war crime and a crime against humanity to kill civilians. Whether a state is doing it, or organization is doing it, or an individual is doing it, is not relevant. It is always justified to kill soldiers. So if a Palestinian attacks and kills three soldiers, he is not a terrorist. He is a freedom fighter. If the same Palestinian crosses the border and blows himself up in a, in a kindergarten, in a kindergarten, no, no, not bus, because in a bus you have soldiers. If the Israelis allow soldiers to be on buses, it's their fault that they attract terrorists. They are guilt guilty also. But if, if this guy goes to a kindergarten, and kills children. He's a terrorist. Same guy. If he kills three soldiers, he's freedom fighter. The next day, he kills ki kids in a kindergarten. He's a terrorist. How can you solve the Palestinian problem? What do you think? If you are if you are American uh, president, what would you do? I don't seem to I don't seem to be able to explain that there is no Palestinian problem and there is no Al Qaeda problem and there is no terrorist organization. The the. How you say the conflict there? The there is no conflict. These are groups that sometimes work with each other, sometimes work against each other, sometimes make profit together. How can there be, be a peace in Palestine? Between the relevant groups there is peace. Netanyahu would never be Netanyahu without Hamas. Hamas would never have won the elections without Netanyahu. These people are symbiotic. They they are at peace. They are working together. Netanyahu's best ally is not the United States. It's Hamas. You must understand that. You must get rid of all these American, you know. How can there be peace there then? What should the uh, uh, Why should there be peace? Everyone is making profits. Everyone is getting elected. Everyone is uh, flourishing. My family, my sister is employed. My brother. Why would I want peace? I'm crazy. I want them unemployed. Why would I want peace? Give me one good reason to have peace. So that nobody can be killed. People get killed in car accidents and you know. So personally you personally don't want to be peace there? No one wants peace there. If people want something, there is peace. The French and the German were fighting for 80 years. Then one day they decided they don't want to fight, so there was peace. No one wants peace, don't you understand? Al-Qaeda and the CIA were collaborators. When the CIA began to act against the economic interests of Al-Qaeda, they became enemies. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the CIA would want to do something in Yemen, and they will have no other possibility except through Al-Qaeda, they will work together again. Tomorrow, Al-Qaeda would, would want to do something in Neslam Kabe, Turkey and we'll need the help of the CIA or the Mossad. Al-Qaeda, we'll need the help of the Mossad. And the Mossad will say, okay, but if you give me this uh, information, and there will be a deal, and the Mossad will help Al-Qaeda in Turkey. Get rid of your concepts of enemies, friends, sympathy, love, affection, history, compassion, they don't exist. It's bullshit sold to the average people. Bullshit sold to the average people. Behind the scenes, there's only one thing, two, money and power, money and power of elites, elites, political elite, military elites and so on. There is a military elite in Egypt. Do you really think there was a revolution in Egypt? Do you think the military will give up 45% of the economy of Egypt that they control now? They let the kids play. They let the kids play. You want to go on the square and write Twitter? Write Twitter. You, but don't dare to touch my factory. You touch my factory, I will kill you. You understand? Muslim Brotherhood, you want to be in government? Makes you feel good? I be in government. Leave us alone. But don't dare to pass a law that the military can no longer manage economic enterprises. Al-Qaeda. You want to conquer Afghanistan? America, you want to conquer Afghanistan? Be my guest. But don't dare 
to act against the opium fields, the poppy fields. Because if you do, we will bomb your Twin Towers. It's all money, it's all power. In 1985, Reagan, Ronald Reagan, worked with Iran. Khomeini Iran, not Shah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. collaborated with Khomeini okay. to sell drugs, both of them, to sell drugs and weapons, to smuggle the money through Iran to Israel. To Israel, from Israel to El Salvador. The Americans wanted to launder the money, not to show that it's coming from America. So, Reagan sold weapons to Khomeini. Okay. To Khomeini. Mm -hmm. Six years after the embassy, when the mm -hmm. you know, Reagan sold weapons to Khomeini. Khomeini sold the weapons to Israel, okay. and Israel sold it to, uh, gave the money to El Salvador, so that it was Israeli, not American. Would you ever believe that there is a possibility for Reagan, Khomeini, and uh, and uh, Eric Sharon to work together? Why Reagan didn't give the money to Israel directly? They wanted to show that it is coming from uh, private mm -hmm. uh, weapons dealers, mm -hmm. and Iran was not able to sell weapons. But Iran had this in stock, so they couldn't sell. You can read about it. It's called the Iran Contra Affair. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. you can read about. It. I'm demonstrating to you mm -hmm. that it's all about money and power. Reagan was arch-conservative, hyper-nationalist American, not possible more. Worked but if you Khomeini. go like this with the, this theory, you can it's actually... It's not a theory, it's a fact. If, you go, if you go with this uh, point of view, you can uh, every revolutionary movement you can say is only about money. You can only. say only also the our uprising in uh, Vimero in uh, 1903. It was about money, right? What about the freedom of the people? Those things. Is that what happened with this so-called revolution? Only joke for the kids. It was true. What happened with this uh, so-called revolution? Didn't I'm talking about fail. serious, not not kid games, not got the Delta and the other uh, children. Talk about serious things. Serious thing is 9/11. Serious thing is Afghanistan. Serious thing is Iran Contra affair. Seri these are serious things, not uh, children playing around and shooting a few Ottoman soldiers. Okay, serious things. Mm -hmm. Serious thing is uh, is uh, Aslo. You, you can say also that the uh, fight for the freedom, uh, excuse me, for the rights of the black people against Martin Luther, Martin Luther King was also for the some kind of narco cartel. You can always attach etiquette no, of money. Say, I didn't say it's uh, for narco cartel, but it was definitely about power. The blacks didn't make any, <laughs> didn't hide it. Black power, they didn't hide it. It was about power. They wanted power. Absolutely, you're right. But and, uh, and yes, but who the, was behind but the, it? But the leaders of Al Qaeda, leader, leaders of Al Qaeda, didn't live luxury life as uh, classical they narco were, cartels in Mexico. They were among, they were among the biggest drug dealers. You don't have to trust me. You can go on. But you can see that the, the apartment of uh, Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. It was well, Osama bin Laden was millionaire to start with. But he was living very poor life. Why was he uh, living that kind Not of life? Not everything is for money. Sometimes it's for power. Osama bin Laden was grandiose. He believed himself to be... Why you, uh, why you are taking out the possibility that maybe he was really fighting for freedom of the what Muslim freedom? people against the It's the, the same guy who collaborated. Money. But it's the same guy who collaborated with CIA yes, only, only, only years so before. To get, to get rid of Russians. But e every politician has a right uh, to make pacts with uh, powers to exactly. get free of some bigger uh, exactly yeah. so, so there are no so there are no, uh, no friends enemies and sympathy it's only the question who is the current enemy one day osama bin laden with america against russia mm -hmm. one day osama bin laden with but still there is a chance that maybe al qaeda was only for but freedom. you're not listening to yourself you just told me yes i understand why osama worked with america to fight russia yes to get rid of uh, so, russians uh, so, so osama is not america against america when he needs America, he works with America. When America is 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 uh, threatening his income and power, mm -hmm. he's against America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing is in stone. It's not a marriage. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes. So, and by the way, we are not talking like uh, 50 years before. Osama was working with America. Osama bin Laden was working with America. 80s. Well, 80s, 90s, well into the 90s, well into the 90s. 1993 was the break. Mm -hmm. So. 
why was he working with America? At the time America had, he was saying that he was working against America because they had bases in Saudi Arabia. Yes. America had far bigger bases in Saudi Arabia in the 70s and 80s than in the 90s and 2000s. Far bigger. Maybe it was a strategic plan. First to read the Russians and then to read the Pamukkale. Are you listening to what you're saying? So there's no ideology, no nothing. Just opportunism. Now I need to get rid of Russia, so I'll work with you. Tomorrow I need to get rid of you, I'll work with Russia. And by the way, he worked with Russia. <laughs> he worked with Russia? Of course, same, same Russia. When? In the late uh, 90s, they worked with Russia. Many of the weaponry that was found after attack on the coal in Yemen, 1998, mm -hmm. was Chinese and Russia. Chinese and Russia. You play by ear um, as it goes, you know, one day I'm your friend, one day I'm her friend. But why am I your friend, why am I her friend? Because I want to preserve my power, my money, and my... Let's finish this interview with the Balkans a little bit. Uh, how do you explain the huge, uh, close relationship be between Albanians and America? And? And America. Between Albania and America? Yeah. I wasn't aware that they have a close relation. I mean, Albanians as a... Uh, Ethnic, because uh, America is very close to the Albanian interest in Kosovo, in Macedonia. Generally, they are big supporters of uh, Albanian interests. Albania bombed Serbia just to help Kos Kosovo in 1999. Uh, I don't think they helped Kosovo because it was Albanian. They helped Kosovo because of geopolitical considerations, the integrity of the European Union, future growth in the Balkans, uh, a bridge to Greece and Turkey and Middle East was heating up and so on. I don't think they bombed them because they were Albanian. Uh, bombed the Serbs because the other party was Albanian. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have any. If anything, the Albanians have an image in the United States like uh, criminals, master criminals, human trafficking and, and so on. We just saw a movie yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they are... Uh, there is an Albanian lobby in, uh, in Congress. It's pretty effective and well organized. That has maybe something to do with it. But Albanians in general have a negative image, I would say, in the United States. They have images backward people mm -hmm. with uh, medieval laws mm -hmm. involved in crime. Mm -hmm. They definitely have a negative image throughout Europe. What okay. about uh, the, the name issue with Greece? Uh, what's your opinion about that conflict with the, between Macedonia and Greece? I'm not sure I'm qualified to comment about this except to say that it is an unprecedented demand and that uh, there is no place for compromise because not because uh, you can't present an unreasonable demand and then modify it and say, so you see, I'm making concessions. <laughs> like, here, I'm making a demand. I want, to, I want to sleep with your wife. And you say, what? No way. A, you know what? Okay, I don't want to sleep with her. I just want to touch her breasts. <laughs> I'm making concession. I don't want to sleep with her anymore. I just, just want to touch her breasts. You know? It's the same with Greece. You know? I want you to modify your name. Okay, then we will compromise. I will touch only you touch her breasts. It's, you can't start from an unreasonable position. You can't make an unreasonable position reasonable in any way. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing. Therefore, any compromise that Macedonia will make on the name issue will have to do with considerations that are more global. Accession to the EU, access to certain funds, uh, integration with Western structures, internal peace and stability, and so on and so forth. But if you isolate just the name issue, the Greek demand is outrageous. And you cannot start with outrageous starting point and end with a reasonable starting point. There's no bridge between the two. And uh, I think the what the I think the current position of Macedonia is to concentrate on the name issue as though it is an isolated thing. Like that's the only issue, and there are no other issues. It's concentrate on the. It's a bit of a mistake geopolitically, of course. But, you know what, as long as Europe is in crisis, Macedonia doesn't have much to gain from integration. So, and you're buying time. Greece is in worse and worse shape. You have more than 120, I think, countries that recognize you with your constitutional name. You're winning. Ultimately, you're winning. So, as long as the adversary is in bad shape, wait. There's nothing to gain from integration right now because you have all the benefits of EU membership, economic benefits of EU membership. You have a visa regime. What do you stand to gain from integrating except destroying your economy because of sanitary and environmental regulations? You don't stand much to gain, economically. Mm -hmm. Politically, it's a different issue. If you join the European Union, the theory is that you will be more stable internally. Albanians will be less, you know. Maybe, maybe not. 
maybe maybe not we see examples in Cyprus and Belgium which don't support this theory tensions in Belgium are the highest ever it's about to break up Cyprus has broken up when he joined and I don't see the European Union help helping in any special way so I don't think if you join the EU it's a guarantee that Macedonia will don't, not disintegrate because of Albanian insurgency or demands or, I don't think it's a guarantee at all and NATO is of course not a guarantee Thank you very much for I'm this uh, interview. Mr. Raknin, I hope uh, we're going to make another interview about, especially about Macedonia sometime. With you anytime. Ah, Macedonia, I don't know, I'm not following, but there are many other subjects to talk about. Well, when can we talk about Macedonia, especially? I'm not following Macedonia, I told you, and it was an honest answer. I'm mm -hmm. simply, last two and a half years, didn't follow Macedonia at all. I don't know what's happening on any sphere, economic, political. And I don't like to talk about things that I don't feel pretty convinced that I know what I'm saying. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel convinced about Macedonia that I know what I'm saying. You were interested about Macedonia, talking about Macedonia before a few years. Yes, up until did, did two, you three years. Did you receive some uh, uh, very interesting uh, messages to stop talking about Macedonia? No one can frighten me into, into silence. Mm -hmm. Was not born the men, organization or government who can frighten me into silence. As simple as that. I think you believe me on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rachni, for this interview. You're welcome. And uh, I hope we will have another interview very soon. So do I. Thank you for having me. Pleasure.